thought of maybe starting with each of you going into your parents and grandparents describing the meeting. Okay. Well, if Dad and I flipped a coin and I get to go first. <laughs> <laughs> I won, though. <laughs> um, I came from a nuclear family of four, and which consisted of my, my mother and my father and my three-year-older brother. Uh, my mother was Grace Poppinger, and my father was William Poppinger, Sr., and my brother was William Poppinger, Jr. Um, to tell you a little bit about that family, they were a nuclear family. My parents were married in 1938. They were married um, way more than 50 years. Um, I, can't, I should have thought about how many exactly, but it was more than, more than 50 years. Um, and uh, I, the, my brother was three years older. They, they moved to Livonia before he was born. So they were some of the first people to ever live in the city of Livonia in a place called Rosedale Gardens. My dad was an accountant for Chrysler Corporation um, from the time he was 18 until he retired in 1975. Uh, my mom was basically a stay-at-home mom, although not always terribly happy with that. So she did a variety of other kinds of things. Most notably, she worked for a very long time in a doctor's office as a receptionist and sort of nurse. Um, she wasn't a, a, a registered nurse, but she did some of the medical kinds of things in that office. Uh, my brother, who was three years older, and I told the kids this story. He, he passed away just this past April. And um, I was telling everybody the story, a little story about his life because I wasn't sure everybody knew it. But uh, my mother had measles when she was pregnant for him. And um, as a result of that, he had an 80% hearing loss and a very significant uh, vision problems. And this was back in 1942. He was diagnosed as retarded, not as deaf and um, with a, a vision problem. So it took a long time for him to catch up to kind of the rest of the world and figure out um, what, you know, what he was going to do. But he ended up getting married and having three boys, just the same as Jim and I had three boys. Um, on my mother's side of the family, that would be the Dawson side. She came from a nuclear family of four. She had one sister, Mildred, and, she ha and her mom and dad. Her dad worked for Detroit Edison Company. Um, that was James Dawson. And her mother, Blanche Dawson, um, was a stay, very much a stay-at-home mom. And um, they lived in the Detroit area all of their married life, many different homes in the Detroit area. Um, my, that grandfather actually passed away before I was born, but I knew that grandma. That was my grandma Dawson. I knew her very well. used to spend nights at her <laughs> house and went shopping with her. And, and um, uh, she was a, a big part of my, my growing up. Um, on my dad's side of the family, he came from a nuclear family of four as well. And he had one brother, John Poppinger, an older brother. And uh, his mother was Mays Poppinger, and his father was Howard Poppinger. And uh, that was my grandma and grandpa on that side. That grandmother died before I was born. So I knew the grandmother, the grandmother on my mom's side. I knew the grandfather on my dad's side. Um, they, my that grandfather also worked for the Detroit Edison Company. They were both started out as linemen, both ended up in supervisory positions with Detroit Edison, which back in the day was a big deal. Um, that were, those were good jobs. Those were good working class um, family, <clears throat> family jobs. <clears throat> um, they, uh, well, one of the interesting stories about them, well, that, that grandmother actually died when my dad was 16. And so he and his brother and his dad uh, lived in Plymouth, Michigan for quite a, quite a while at, at, um, during their teenage years. And then uh, my grandpa on that side remarried a woman by the name of Dorothy who very much became my grandmother. She was a wonderful woman and uh, never had children or grandchildren of her own, so we were very much a part of her life. In 1950, when I was 52, when I was seven, they moved to um, Florida, to a place called uh, Leesburg, Florida. And um, that was, again, that was a big deal for that day, to have grandparents who retired and moved to Florida. Um, they, they, they weren't wealthy by any stretch, but they, they kind of figured out their finances and were able to do that at a time in, in, um, in, in life that 
that was great for us because we get to go there and visit. We got to, um, you know, they would come and visit us. It was a, a lot of going back and forth. Um, they eventually moved to a place called Venice. They adopted a daughter uh, named Carol Ann. Carol Ann was, um, I'm trying to think, probably seven or eight years older than I was and very much uh, my favorite relative because she was all the fun, you know. She, nobody else uh, would play the games and do the kinds of things. It was like having a seven-year-older cousin, only in this case, it was a seven-year-older um, yeah. aunt. And of the, the two families that uh, are, are uh, my parents' generation, an uncle on one side had four children, and my aunt on the other side had three children. So I essentially had seven cousins. And we did get together as kids, and we had family gatherings. And um, everybody didn't always get along. I mean, there were moments where it didn't go too well. But on the whole, those uh, the, the cousins and um, my aunts and uncles and my parents got together on a, on a regular basis. Uh, I have to go back another generation to the great-grandparents, but there's only one of those that I really know, so I'm going to talk about her. Uh, she was my father's mother's mother, so my, grand, my paternal great-grandmother, and her name was Eva Wagner, and she was married uh, to, uh, I really don't know what her husband did for a living, but he died quite young, and so she was left with literally no financial resources. She um, came to live with my parents when I was probably about three or four and lived in my home. She and I shared a bedroom the whole time we were growing up. And um, she was uh, uh, very German. Her, her name was Wagner and she married a Zimmerman, very German names. I'm, my side of, my dad's side of the family is also quite German so I identify with the, the whole German heritage. But she was a spectacular woman. She lived in our home, never caused a bit of trouble. She just did the work and took care of things and was a very kind and gentle and generous woman. Um, when I was probably about 10 or 12, she fell and broke her hip and my mother cared for her for several years. There wasn't any social security then. There weren't retirement accounts then. There was nothing. Uh, to take care of her. So my parents spent um, their excess income in her, for her medical bills. There was no insurance covering her. Um, it was back in a very different time in our culture. And it just happened. That's just what people did. It wasn't a matter of, you know, um, making that a choice. There wasn't anybody else in the family to do it. Um, I don't know any very much about any of my other um, great-grandparents. Uh, although I do, I, I do guess I want to say that my, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather on my dad's side was one of 13 children, and he just relished in chatting about that. Um, and, and for what I understand, it was a, it was a good time. They had a, they had a good growing up um, somewhere in Ohio. I'm not even sure where. And, of course, as I was thinking about all of this, I was wishing that my mom and dad were here to tell me the details that I need to do <laughs> to be able to tell you all of this. I do have a family tree that my brother created somewhere that has um, the details, and um, I didn't look that up for today, but it is available for us to make, um, to, to put out for people to see or to include <clears throat> in whatever ways we want with this. So um, I think that's what I can say, yes. Can you talk about Uncle Tom a bit? <laughs> well, he was a huge figure in being a Tom Blair. Yeah. And so, and we don't, we don't know that. We don't personally okay. know that. And maybe it would be better if I told it because I see it <laughs> from a whole different light. Yeah, you go ahead. So we're talking about uh, John Poppinger, Bill Poppinger's brother, who is Joanne's uncle. And he was a marvelous guy. Uh, he was, uh, in those days, a man's man. At his funeral, there was a fellow that came in and went to, right to the casket and just started to cry. And nobody knew what he was doing. He cried and cried. And when he left, someone asked, they found out who he was. Uncle John was on scaffolding, and inside the Trite Edison uh, buildings, there were no floors. So it might go up four or five floors, uh, with it just open. Well, he fell from the top and John was halfway down and had the strength enough to grab him and pull him into his scaffolding till the guy could hold on. So, and he just got down. 
uh, they both got found. So that was it. And John didn't tell anybody. No, and nobody knew. He, uh, uh, he and my dad were, were best buddies. friends. They were brothers. They were best friends. They lost their mother very young, yeah. and I think um, that was part of the reason that was their sense of family. Their dad remarried. Hans. Then they call each other Hans or something? Right. Yeah, Hans, I think my well, dad called he was, him. When I went to my first date with Joanne, and this was really with your mom, this was kind of tenuous because there I was scared. Uh, she had just broken up with the captain of the football team, and there, there comes Jim, the tennis player, okay. over to take Joanne out to play tennis on a date. John, uh, Uncle John and Bill and Joe's dad were sitting on the back porch so I felt I had to go through uh, kind of a, an inquisition to go, and it, it worked out well. And John and I became really good friends. We went to a, uh, the other side's, Jim Berry's wedding, and it was dry, and I was a sophomore in college, and John uh, leaned over and said, Jim, this is really not the way it should be. Let's go out in the parking lot. <laughs> so John and I went out in the parking lot, and in his trunk, he had a lot to drink, and we stayed out there the whole wedding. And that was really, really fun. So he's that kind of guy, and he would do anything for you. Uh, he was also the last of the, of the cowboys. So that's my take on him. And, you know, if I was his sons, I'd probably say something different. But Those are our memories. Does that cut into my time? <laughs> that I'm... One more thing, Mom. Do you know anything about immigration with your grandparents and great-grandparents? Not much. Um, my none of my parents or or grandparents or great grandparents emigrated. They all were already in this country, so they had been here a very long time. By comparison, it must have been the generation bef before that would have been my great great grandparents, um, because I never heard any stories about their immigration. I think they were always mostly in the Pennsylvania Ohio area, that kind of that area. Growing up, sometimes I almost feel like I can talk about mom's family as much as she can because I've been such a part of it for so long. And her dad, Bill, was really uh, one of my mentors in life, and he was he was a guy who we tried to mold um, you guys' personality around, and he he was that strong of a person for us. He was he was really a neat man. So do you want to talk about your family? I was wondering if I was going to get a I chance. Think it's your <laughs> and this way for a moment. And, the, and, the and you've got a much more complicated family than I do. <laughs> and the sad part is I don't know what a nuclear family is. Is that atomic <laughs> or what is that? But I'll that tell means you. the people that live in one house. I see, at one time. Um, I guess I can start. I was uh, part of a, a family. There was five kids in the family. Um, with a, a dad who was a tool and die maker and a mom who was a housewife. My mom was only 18 years older than me. Uh, she, when my dad was, uh, went into the Navy, she followed him to Great Lakes, which is in Chicago, uh, and they were married over there. And then uh, she got pregnant and uh, she came back to Detroit and had me. And that time my dad was in Lakehurst, New Jersey. And so I went up to Lakehurst on a troop train, and I was been told that I was the hit of the train with all the soldiers and the Navy men uh, going out there. So she had a lot of babysitting help. How old were you? But huh? How old were you? I was uh, months old, not very old. And then when we got to to New Jersey, we didn't have a crib. So for that extent of my life, I slept in the bottom drawer of a dresser, and uh, so but I didn't know it. And uh, so that was the, that was the beginning with them. Uh, uh, they, uh, my my dad was Presbyterian, and he probably was a good Presbyterian, whatever that means. And my mom was Catholic. And when they were getting married, the priest wouldn't let uh, my dad raise us. Um, no, he had to raise us Catholic, and he wouldn't do that. So my mom was excommunicated out of the church. Well, and. During her last rites, when she died, they forgave all of that because those times were just different in the Catholic Church. So she happily got to go to heaven on, with that. And the really funny part is, is that my dad being Presbyterian and also from Belfast, Ireland, where this the Orangeman, um, he was given his last rites 
by an Irish Catholic, uh, and, and uh, my, so my brother Sean got the last licks in on that one. The, uh, my sibs are, I have Georgie, Georgianne, who's my oldest sister, um, Kevin is my middle brother, and then I have Sean, um, the youngest brother, and then I have a younger sister named Erin. There was another baby in there that died uh, early on, or my mom lost her. So we tried to be good Catholic family, but it was, it was work. Um, I, I think I can talk about my mom a little bit. She uh, was invited to play in the Detroit Symphony as a woman, as a girl, and a girl from a parochial school. She played trumpet, and uh, so she did do that. And I had, I wore from the time I was probably 13 to 15, her suede jacket that her uncle gave her for playing in the symphony as a kind of a present for that. Uh, and then true to the, uh, that time, probably in her early 20s, her teeth went bad. They pulled them all out and gave her false teeth and she couldn't play the trumpet anymore. Uh, and she was from a family, her maiden name was Fitzgerald. Fitzgerald was made up of two, uh, of the, her shoes had on one side, her mom was a Liesenfeld out of Chicago. Uh, she was one of 13 people, uh, kids. They were farmers from Hammond, Indiana, or Chicago. Uh, and my grandmother, her mom, or my grandmother, uh, started a business uh, when she was 21 and she built it up until she was about 32, I think, when she sold it, or a little bit older, and it was to crochet women's yokes, which are things that go around their neck to make a dress pretty. And so she's, we've got four books uh, that were published that are in, what's it, uh, not the? Library of Congress. Library of Congress. And so I still have those and they're kind of neat. And she was really uh, an aggressively strong woman way before we would think of women's rights because that, that group of people coming out of Chicago were tough and uh, she, they got the right to vote and all that. So she was a, a great grandma to have. She always, uh, she uh, was always kind of overly organized and uh, we used to tease her, she was, she was German. And uh, so that was it. And on my grandfather's side, he was a Fitzgerald. Uh, he was from a farm up in Richmond, Michigan. Uh, he was the oldest of probably, uh, I, I don't know, I think there's probably 10 or 12 kids. His goal was always to go to Michigan State College of Agriculture and become an engineer. But his dad died when he was uh, about 14, or whatever you are in the eighth grade. So he quit, uh, quit school in the eighth grade and ran the family farm until the next one came up to run the farm, next, his next brother. And he moved to Detroit to become a, a contractor. He became a, a, a carpenter and uh, worked on some really neat old buildings in Detroit. And uh, so as kids, we could go around and see, see those buildings. It was really fun. Um, the Fitzgerald family, if you go back a few generations, when they came from Southern Ireland, uh, the, a lot of the shopkeepers that were Fitzgerald stayed out east in Boston and the farmers came west to uh, Michigan and he logged and, uh, during the pine, when they took all the pine trees out of, out of uh, Michigan. But, um, so that's about the, as far as the history. Uh, on McFall side, my grandma was a Tensley. She had four, four sisters. Uh, one stayed in Ireland, another stayed right here in Detroit with her. And then her sister went out to Santa Monica and in the 20s and 30s built a, a hotel uh, in Santa Monica. We never saw it, but my grandmother went out every year to see her. So she was kind of good and, and her, she was, uh, Grandma McFall was tough. She could do anything. She walked all over the west side of Detroit. Her job, she got money. She cleaned a dentist, uh, doctor's office. That was how she, uh, she, funded her, her whole existence. But the house was paid for, 
and uh, one of her big things of pride was Rosie the Riveter. She got to go into a factory and ran machines during the Second World War, and she was the one who didn't really want to quit when the war was over. So uh, <clears throat> she was good, good to me. I always used to spend time there, and that was one of the neat things when I tease you guys about doing dishes, that um, after dishes at night when I stayed with her, we'd always go sit on the front porch, and I'd have lemonade, and that's because all the neighbors walked up and down the sidewalk and talked to us on the porch, which was only about 15 feet from the sidewalk. Uh, back when that was an every night ritual, so um, they were really an integral part of my uh, youth, and probably of all those, the the guy that was most important was my grandfather Fitzgerald. We called him Grandpa Fitz. He was the contractor who worked till he was 80 some years old, and he was he built church, the Catholic churches, and um, then uh, he retired. And the story that I always tell about it is. He, we, we, he was in a nursing home down in Eloise, a Wayne County uh, nursing home. And I went down there, we were first married, and he was sitting in a wheelchair with a robe around him, all huddled in a dusty hall, watching contractors uh, build the, the uh, extension on the nursing home. I said, Grandpa, doesn't this bore you? And he looked at me and said, you know, Jim, this is one of the jobs I've supervised. I've never had to worry about payroll. I don't have to worry about it. if they get the job done properly. I just sit here and direct. So then until his, his time for his nap every day was, um, it was, would come around. So, and I think the, the, the interesting thing about that, that nursing home existence, which was, we thought was going to be very hard on them. They kind of loved it. People took care of them, three hot meals a day, a place to sleep. And um, they, but they wouldn't let them sleep in the same room. Back in those days, they had to be in separate rooms. She was in a, in a, the woman's wing, I suppose, and he in the yeah. male wing. But he would go every day and take his nap in her bed in the, in, yeah, he in was, the nursing was, home. That was a highlight for him uh, daily. So he'd work like heck and sit in his wheelchair directing the job, then take his nap. And um, then he died. He probably spent close to a year there. And I, it wasn't a bad part of his life because his kids and grandkids all came to see him. Another interesting story about them was that um, at our wedding, um, I don't know if I'll have a chance to talk about that more, but at our wedding, it was on December 30th, 1966, and it was a freezing cold rain and it had been a miserable day. And um, coming in from the wedding to the reception, which is at the Plymouth Meeting House in Plymouth, um, they were hit by a car. And um, it wasn't it wasn't awful, uh, but they did take them to the hospital. But they insisted on coming back to the reception. And these were people probably in their 80s at that point. Yeah, maybe. young 80s, early yeah. 80s. Um, but they came back to the reception and ate and danced. Danced and you know, uh, I'm sure they were a little bruised up, but uh, but they did okay. That was. Yeah, yeah Kurt. While we're talking about that, then um, is that the soccer player? No. The soccer player was my dad's father. Uh, so, and his name was Joseph Booth McFall versus my dad's name was Joseph Shaw McFall. Joseph Booth McFall was brought to Detroit by a man who owned a tool and die shop and always tried to bring in soccer teams. So my grandfather played soccer in Ireland or in Belfast and he was a tool maker uh, at the same time. So he, he came uh, here, and I just found out that he was a soccer player about two years before my dad died. I had no idea. And uh, so... Did you say what your dad and your grandpas did for a living? No. <laughs> my dad was a tool maker, and he was, uh, he, was in the, he was a Detroit jobber, which means there was very few of them. There was probably 300 to 500, maybe not even that many, uh, jobbing tool makers so that went around the city uh, when the programs were, were going. Uh, he would run tool and die shops. Uh, he was part owner of, of one. Um, when the economy went south in 1952, he and a Jewish buddy who was a tool maker started a bakery and they pride themselves on having developed the chicken pot pie. And all that was is wasted turkey or scrap turkey <laughs> and chicken mixed with some gravy and a crust, and they started selling it. But when the, uh, when the economy came back, they uh, both went back to the trade, 
and they sold their bakery to Ori's Bakery, which was a local bakery around here. So he was a tool maker, and his dad was a tool maker, and one of his, my father's biggest disappointments in life, he and his dad were going to open up a gauge shop when he got out of the Navy. And um, so they had, they had planned on doing it, and uh, then he died for my dad. And so with, when my grandpa died, uh, because he was a surviving son, head of the family, then he didn't have to go overseas. So they put, they changed his, not ranking, but he, sta he stayed sa stateside on that time. He was a, a, a mechanic on uh, an aircraft, uh, aircraft carrier, and uh, also, uh, he would go. He would run the elevator on the hangar from the hangar deck up to the uh, top deck on a plane. So that was his job. And his dad was proud to come to the United States. He, he they came. Soccer was one reason, but in reality, he was stymied. He could never go higher than what his he was the class he was born into, uh, no matter what. And uh, Ireland was really segregated that way, and there's really no way to go up. So when my dad built his first kayak in, uh, in uh, Detroit, when, as a kid, he was probably 20 years old, um, my, my dad took his dad for a trial run out on Point Pelee in the marsh. And my dad said he could hardly get his dad out of the boat because he kept saying, huh, no one's going to believe that, that a tool maker has its own yacht. This is unbelievable. <laughs> so uh, he was just, he was really a grateful American to be here, that whole family was. I think the last thing historically you should talk about is the immigration of your dad and your grandparents. Yeah, uh, uh, my dad. Well, they they came from Belfast, and they he worked for the shipyard that built the Titanic. Uh, it's called Hammond or something. I can't remember the name. And uh, my grandma was a young, really young then, and they had my dad, who was two years old. So they immigrated into Canada. They didn't go through the. I always thought they went through the Statue of, of uh, Statue of Liberty or, or oh, Ellis Island, and they didn't. They came through Toronto, and Toronto to Windsor to Detroit, uh, because they were sponsored by the uh, family in Detroit. And then. Um, so you're first generation Irish. Yeah. Uh huh. So and that and a cup of coffee will get you some conversation, <laughs> but that's just about it, you know. Uh, so, and he was a cocky guy, my dad. He was proud of what he had built and proud of where he was in society. As kids, I didn't know that I wasn't wealthy. We, we always had uh, everything that we possibly wanted. Um, and, and so, you know, when I got into high school, we, moved, we were in an area of Livonia where there was a lot of different, there was professional folks and all that. And so um, we as kids, my my brothers and sisters um, thought was that we were the top of the heap, and so it was. It was really fun. Um, I think it's important to say that that um, socioeconomically, yeah. um, we were very much working class family. Although my dad did move, he had a couple years of college, and he did move into sort of the white collar mm -hmm. job. Um, but but basically, our history was very much working class, and. Um, a lot of emphasis was put on, and a lot of expectation put on us that we needed to move beyond that. We were, um, there was a lot of pressure in my home at least that you will go to college. There was, there was no decision to be made there. And to the best possible college you can get into, it didn't matter what you're gonna do with it. Um, but, um, you know, uh, it, was, it, was a, it was an interesting time because I grew up in a neighborhood too where there were a lot of professional folks. One of, one of my best girlfriends, her dad was the doctor and he wasn't like the neighborhood doctor. He was the doctor for Livonia. He was the only doctor in Livonia at that time. And you know, they went on trips to Disneyland and they went, you know, they did all kinds of things that none of the rest of us did, but there were a few people. So we had that sort of vision of there, there is some, there's another place you can go financially. But, but socially, I think we both came from very strong um, middle class families even though economically maybe we were kind of at the lower end of that. There, to go along with that, for when we were young and we were starting, there was a huge, for, for me, there was a, a, a tremendous hurdle to get over 
uh, it was blue collar. Even though I was in, I got into Michigan Tech and was doing okay and switched to Michigan State and was doing okay, uh, there was always the pressure of becoming a pattern maker or going and becoming a tool maker. On that. Uh, when I started college, my folks had no idea what I was, they, they didn't know anything about the colleges. My dad asked me what I was going to be, and I said, well, I'm going to be a forest major. He says, yeah, that's cool. What, what is a forest major? I said, well, they work in the woods and to put out fires and all that. Well, how much do they make? And at that time, it was $5,200 a year. And my dad says, you're going to do what? You're going to go to four years of school and make $5,200 a year? My God, I've got apprentices that make more than that. So he was really empathetic on my goal, <laughs> my, my goals not, for, not higher, much support going <laughs> for uh, higher education. But um, in, the, in the end result, probably the biggest compliment my dad had ever gave me uh, was after I had started at Ford, uh, I was an engineer, he was running a tool shop out in uh, Redford Township called Cook, Do, and Die. I stopped in one day and he introduced me, th this is my son, he's the Ford man. And so that, that probably was the, the height that I ever knew of, that he was proud of what I had done. And uh, so that was good. So okay. we had different levels of ex um, oh, no. time's up? No. Oh, no. Mike. Mike. Yeah, I had a question. Uh -oh. yeah, Wait, Mike, we're at a half hour, if that means anything. Well, let's go. Let's, let's I think we're almost, I, yeah. I have one or two more on this. I just wanted to emphasize something. Hey, like, to me anyway, and I don't know if you guys feel the same way, I mean, the grandparents that have the most influence on your dad's family. Yep. Uh, by a long shot. By a long shot. Uh, Me too. <laughs> and so, can you talk about, I mean, you said he worked with Chrysler, um, but he had a lot of other things yeah. he was involved in. Yeah. And, and, like, I would like to hear about some of that. And then you worked with him for some time. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, he was, he started out in the mailroom at Chrysler. And he worked his way up to be an accountant through going to a couple of years of night school at University of Detroit. And that was his professional job, and that's what supported us as a family. But he also um, it was, it was a small businessman in a way because he did accounts. He did accounting for, I don't know, probably 15 or 20 businesses, small businesses, a and W Root Beers, um, a greenhouse, oh Probably gosh, uh, uh, realtors, builders. He had all yeah. of his friends that were in business, he, was, he would do their, their accounting. And I did, I worked for him. I did a lot of the paperwork for him. Um, and that's how I earned money when I was in high school. And, um, of course, he would always say I spent half the time, he was paying me for the time I spent on the phone, which was probably very true. Uh, he had a little, be a little office down in the basement next to the furnace with his little adding machine. And, um, but, but he also uh, was, the other things that he did is he invested in a radio station way back in, that was in Garden City or somewhere mm -hmm. that eventually got off the ground, but I don't think he I ever well. realized any real money from it, which had been his dream that he would. Um, but he also, uh, when he retired and moved to Florida, he was president of the association the, where they lived, and he was a president of the golf um, uh, club where, they, where he played, and he was president of the bowling league in Livonia, and he was, you know, so he was always, he was probably, at, at least at that point in time, one of the most social people I had ever known. Um, he loved everybody, everybody loved him, and I can honestly say, I don't remember my dad ever saying a bad word about anybody, ever. It was just him. So, does that do it, Mike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. And I think, to add that a little bit, there's another side to him, that the first year I started dating your mom, that was a spring, and then she went down to Brazil for three months, two months, but uh, Grandpa Poppinger was so happy to have someone to go fishing with. He would come and pick me up from after work at the pool, and we'd go fishing in Lake St. Clair. And I wasn't a bit, so that was, that was a summer of... He liked you. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mom, can you talk a little bit about, um, Grant, speaking of Livonia and your parents, Grandma's role in school grounds, okay. yeah. speaking of education. Yeah, she was very much... Um, a proponent of education. She never, uh, she got her high school diploma, but she, and she very much would have, Grace Poppinger, my mom, Grace Poppinger, she would have loved to um, 
have gone to college and she certainly had all the ability in the world to have done that and it's one of the sad days that that when I think about uh, her potential um, but you know she did what she did she did very well and one of the things that I do remember Kurt was she was on the board that planned um, and did the fundraising and the uh, whatever you needed to do at that time I have no idea what uh, to get Schoolcraft College into Livonia um, as a community college. It's one of the first community colleges, maybe the first in Michigan. Highland Park was. Highland Park was that maybe ahead of that. <clears throat> but certainly the first suburban um, school to, uh, uh, community college. And um, she didn't want us to go there. I mean, you know, that wasn't part of the game. But she wanted that education to be available um, to all the kids. And um, she was very proud of, of her work with that. And I, and she did a lot of other community-based kinds of things. Dollars she was, for scholars. Dollars for scholars. She was on the scholarship committee for our high school and raised all kinds of money for um, uh, some of the, the kids to that were going to go on to college. And, and I, I can't remember the timing of that, but I think it was before, during, and after the time I was in high school. Um, and I, she was one of the founders of that. There may be, have been two or three people that pulled that Dollars for Scholars thing together. And I'm sure it grew out of the school craft piece too, Kurt. But, um, yeah, she was all about education. She, uh, I don't know what she would have been had she gone to college in her day. I'm not sure what where what she would have pursued. Um, she had an engineering mind, and unlike me, <laughs> so she might have done she might have done that. I'm not sure. She was in some kind. She just wrote a little jingle, and I am sure I have it somewhere. And in my retirement, somewhere, sometime, I will go through and find all that stuff. Um, I'm sure it's there in the boxes that I have somewhere. But she wrote this little jingle about why I buy Cheerios, and she won a dryer. And that was in the days when everybody had a washer, maybe the old ringer washers, although she had an automatic washer, but nobody had dryers. Everybody was hanging them out on the line, because, and she had this dryer, and the neighbors would come over and use the dryer on rainy days, and it was quite the spectacle. But we didn't have a television. Um, one of the neighbors got a television first, so she and my mom would sort of trade off. My mom would go to watch their television, and, and Edith would come over and, and uh, dry the clothes. That's, I had totally forgotten that. Thank you. The, the one thing that I wonder about is um, parents or grand, your parents and grand, great grandparents are great, grandparents are great companies. Sports was a big thing. Like grandpa played football, grandpa Bob you played football. What were the, some of the family sports? For my side? Well, you go first. Yeah, my dad was a, um, you guys didn't know him, but he was a tremendous athlete. Uh, he could jump through his, his legs when he was 30 years old and uh, do all kinds of gymnastic kinds of things. He would put, he could pole vault. He was never in organized uh, sports. Uh, he was a golfer and he was, uh, he was asked to go on tour, uh, but it, that was completely different than today, I'm sure. But he was already an apprentice to Undimicus, so he said, no, golf is just for fun. and. Uh, but so uh, I, as a, as a young kid, I always caddied for him. I had a golf course that was at 10 Mile and Telegraph. He and my uncle Toby would go out every Sunday morning, and I'd go with him, and we'd golf. Okay. Uh, it's not there now. It's where 10, uh, uh, 10 Mile and Telegraph is. That's the sub. The, the uh, We'll come up with it later. No, no, it's not there. It's not there. And uh, so he was a golfer, uh, and but it seemed like in, in, he and I would throw axes. We we made a stump that was huge, and we spent a lot of time out in the backyard learning how to throw axes. But, but um, organized sports, the kind of sports that you guys played, was not valued uh, in your family no, at all. Uh -uh. No, in fact, probably discouraged. Are not known about it, yeah. but even yeah. though he was a soccer player, his dad was a soccer player. Uh, he never played soccer because that was that was not a, a sport that the kids in the U.S. did. You know. Did he sail? No, he. But the, we sailed his a lightning every Sunday afternoon because he. We always tease my mom. He had I think uh, one of the bonuses he got was like nine hundred dollars, which was huge back then, and he bought my mom a. Uh, Dining room set. That that's that was his lightning. So, uh, yeah, Kurt. Well, one of the questions I have, um, I think it's relevant now, given what you guys have chosen to do.
do um, after you retire on the boat. Um, <laughs> I remember as a kid, at least at the Poppinger side, you know, boating was a big thing. Yeah. And you've already talked about it. Um, is there anything more you can say on where you think that came from or what it meant to the family? It was a big deal for them. Yeah. Well, when, when Grandpa's mom died, his dad bought a piece of property on Sweezy Lake, which is not very far. It's out toward Jackson, that direction. <coughs> um, and that summer, they built a cottage, and that was sort of to keep Uncle John, probably, mostly, and my dad out of, off the streets and out of trouble. And they built a cottage out there. And um, it was a small lake, but, um, I, and I, that's, oh no, if I go back even further, so, when my dad yeah. lived on, uh, in, Detroit. in Detroit, he had a, he built a hydroplane and he raced on the Detroit River in this little tiny hydroplane. I can't even, I mean, nothing like the hydroplanes of today. Um, so I guess boating was probably always in his life. And sports, I mean, it, if it had a ball and a stick, he was just perfectly happy. It didn't matter, you know, what sport it was, yeah, if it was, good. And he yeah, was good yeah. at it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He could he could play. We took him out to play tennis one day. We're kind of explaining to me. He picks up the tennis racket and he's just he never played before. He knew exactly what to do. Well, and how many hole in ones and how many three hundred? Oh wow, he had three hole in ones, I believe. At least two. I'm going to say I, two. I know he had two. Um, and a lot of three hundred. A lot of three hundred bowling games. Yeah. yeah. But he, he bowled a lot and he golfed a lot. You know, there are percentages there. Yeah. yeah. But the boating was part of the Detroit scene back then. Mm. In the 20s and 30s, we had um, the, all the bread companies sponsored huge hydroplanes. So the Detroit River was, and we just gotten through Prohibition, where we all of, we had rum runners that were out of Detroit, and he used to hang out in the, in the river. And uh, so uh, it was important to him. Um, but our mothers didn't come from athletic families. I mean, my mother certainly didn't. Um, and, bike know. riding. Yeah, I mean, they would, they would, they were sort of a little bit outdoorsy, but nothing like that. But I know that I loved the the sporting end of it from the time I was just a little kid. And 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 my brother, who was the boy, you know, wasn't that good in sports, so I kind of took over that role um, in our family. But loved. Every opportunity I had to play something new, I loved it too. And one of the major issues that, I, that Mom and I got together is on our first date, we went to, after the tennis, there was a, like a, a Friday night after the football game kind of thing, we went to a friend's house and she had a bumper pool set. And Mom uh, ran the table. <laughs> and I mean, I've never played meaning, before in my life. Yeah, you <laughs> run all five balls and, and get them in. Uh, I said, that's the lady I want. <laughs> so I remember trying to make an impression. I guess I really did. So, um, here's my best one more question, then we can break it. We can move on to the next topic. Mm -hmm. Can you go through and talk about your parents, each one of your parents, and their hero as you remember? Who would have Grandma's hero back? Who would have oh, Grandma's hero back? Yeah, that's easy. This, this one. We talked about yeah. that today. Mike's question was, who were our parents' heroes, we thought, we think. Um, I'm going to say my dad's hero was his dad. Uh, and my mom's heroine, it varied at different times in her life. Um, her, her sister uh, was a model for her. And um, I don't remember actors or, or politicians for my mom uh, at all so and, and my dad was his his dad so yours well I think I know my mother's hero was uh, Eleanor Roosevelt absolutely no doubt about it um, and we were driving on you you told me it's Woodward but I think it was eight mile I'm not sure somewhere in Detroit one day on a Saturday and this black limousine pulled up next to us and uh, my mother looked over there and went, oh my god that's Eleanor Roosevelt and I had no idea. I was, I was probably nine or ten, and I wasn't. I mean, maybe I sort of had. But I remember seeing those teeth. I mean, everybody remember. But that was Eleanor Roosevelt, and she she would have loved the series that's been recently on TV about the the and uh, that public television about about Eleanor Roosevelt. Well, about Roosevelts. My dad, I'm not sure, but what I remember him enjoying were comedians. 
He loved Jack Benny and Bob Hope and Jackie slapstick. Gleason, slapstick and humor. I mean, he that was just sort of what what he enjoyed. Um, there might have been somebody else, but I'm, I can't really come up with anybody right now. And then talk about the Argentina situation. Yeah, sure. And it would, it would be, be fun uh, because I think as a young kid, I was really proud of him. And he gave us a lot of bragging rights. Um, but as a jobber, he would have some of the better tool and die jobs in the city of Detroit. And that was all automotive. And he did everything from uh, working on the bench, which means he was actually cutting the steel, to layout, which means he's leading a job, to layout on the steel and other uh, machinists would cut the steel, to actually running the shops. And the, the one that was most fun is uh, Harley Earl was vice president of General Motors wanted to make a car called a Corvette. And they picked my dad's, and at that time he was part owner uh, of a shop, he was a minority owner, to make the fiberglass uh, model of it. They did do that, but the, uh, and then they were asked would they be involved in the production side of it. And uh, my dad's partner was the money guy. He said there's no future. And that, and and not and not going to pursue it. Just stay a tool and die shop. Well, and, and it was a good decision for him because he didn't. Uh, uh, he stayed a tool and die shop. Then my dad left there and went went on. And one of the places that he went to was Kaiser Fraser. And Kaiser Fraser uh, made cars. Uh, they they ventured into cars. The Henry J was one of their little buggy cars. They were subcompact. But my dad's responsibility was uh, an exper experimental tool and die, which generally meant aircraft. And Kaiser Fraser was out at Willow Run uh, in Ypsilanti. And uh, my dad was uh, in charge of experimental tool and die. Well, Kaiser Fraser was growing worldwide on that, and they had a plant in Argentina. And they wanted, uh, they asked, asked my dad, and I guess he was promoted, although we never talked about that is to run the whole tool and die shop in Argentina, both experimental and production tool and die. And so we were all set to go. My folks started to do the stuff with uh, uh, the State Department at that time. And uh, then Argentina went into a revolution at that, and they burnt the plant. The plant was burnt down. So the Kaiser just backed out completely, and my dad ended up staying at the Ipsy, Ipsy plant. So we were all excited as kids. There was only three of us in the family. Then Kevin, it was Georgie, myself, and Kevin. Uh, but we were going to move to Argentina. We had no idea where Argentina <laughs> was. I thought it was somewhere. Is this south of Bell? Is this south of Bell Isle? Because I had been to Bell Isle, and we had no concept of what that meant. But uh, everybody was excited to do it. So that was just one of the fate or one of the things that he did. And I think his probably. The happiest he was was when he wasn't managing people. He was managing projects. Uh, he uh, had no tolerance for people who wouldn't work, who wouldn't work as hard as he did. Uh, and so then when, when he, later on in his life, he went back to General Motors, which was where he got his apprenticeship. And they gave him all the seniority he had, he had earned uh, up until that time, which was like 12 no, or 13 years. So all he needed was seven more years for some level of retirement. So he went back in and went on the bench for the last seven year, years of his career, and I think he really liked it. So, But he retired too early. He, he got out because he had some issues with his heart, and the, do and he was, the doctors told him, you got to slow down, you can't do this, when in reality, that's just the opposite of what he should have been, should have been doing. So, uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. Do you so, notice? Go ahead. So my my question would be. You guys are full of humility, always. But if you look generationally at people who would have, let's say, made the largest leaps uh, socioeconomically, um, you guys have to. Admit parents' lives to the lives you guys live some 40, 50 years later. Pretty dramatic. Um, you, associate director of school, major 
research institution that you, an MBA, own your own business, selling your business, and all, everything that you've done. If you could look back in your childhood and talk about an event that, that you remember that changed your trajectory from maybe what was to what could be. And maybe it was a person, maybe it was I'm just curious because you both were able to just like time warp out of a, like out of one sort of way of living into a completely different way. That's a good question. Yeah. I, I'll I'll start with that one. Um, it's interesting when you say uh, you know that we made this this huge leap because I had seven cousins and. There's only one other cousin and myself, and he's older than <coughs> I am, so I can't say I'm the first in my generation to get a college degree because he was a couple, three years older and got one before I did. My oldest uh, cousin on my mother's side, nobody else. There isn't another cousin in that whole crew. They all did okay. I mean, they had good lives. They were happy with their lives, but nobody went to college. Nobody had that sort of looking forward, and I know exactly where it came from, and I can, I, I've got the conversation in my mind where it happened, and I was probably in second grade, and it was from my mother, and it was when they would, they had first started the Iowa tests, which were the the standardized testing that they did back in the day. And um, I don't remember even taking the test, but apparently I did very well on the test because I had, she had been at parent-teacher conferences and had gotten these scores. And I remember just her saying to me in the car that day going home in the afternoon, I don't think my dad was at the conference, I think just I was at the conference and outside the room and she was in the room. We were in the car coming home and she said, you know, I found out today you can do anything you want to do. And both with, that was both, you know, pressure, which she always could manage to put on me as well, but also the confidence that, that I had the ability to do whatever I wanted to do. And I remember always feeling that way. So that's, that's where it came from for me. And my dad was always very supportive of all of that. I mean, you know, he would just sort of expect that I would do well and encourage that, you know. Hmm. How about you? That's a lot of pressure, <laughs> you know. Uh, let me repeat the question, Mike, so I understand. What, what event uh, that I can remember caused me or gave me incentive to do more than I was doing or could do or something like that? Uh, there's, there's a couple, and one of them is a little bit of a landmark-esque kind of thing. Was uh, to I always thought it was to my uh, advantage, and it might have been to my detriment too, is that I could do anything myself. I don't need lots of people. And um, I can remember the situation where I was raking with my mom and dad in the backyard at our house in Detroit. I was about six years old, and my dad didn't have a rake for me. And so he was raking, and I didn't, so didn't have anything to do. So, so I went downstairs, and we had a shop then, and I used his good nails. That meant that they weren't bent. And I made, and I made a rake out of it, and I nailed that together, and I came outside, and I started, I can do it, and, and started rake, well, the rake fell apart. But I thought that I was kind of cool. So th that was one, one time, and that was really little. Uh, academically, I never was given uh, too much encouragement until I had to start relying basically on myself to give that encouragement. In high school, I didn't know I was, uh, I didn't know I was smart. And I thought I was, I thought like, I was like my music teacher once said, Jim, you can't play the tone net, get out of here and go and play basketball or something like that. And so I did, and I, my music ability is zero. But as far as math, and all, I think the biggest opportunity, there was two kids. I was in the Inkster schools. Two of us in the third grade that did really well. And we were kind of neck and neck to see who could skip the fourth grade. Because they used to do that in those days. Well, he skipped the fourth grade. And I'm not, I didn't get the chance to do it. And I'm not sure it was that my mom and dad didn't think it was a good idea or that I wasn't good enough. 
and so I went into a little bit of a slide there. Uh, for, for th third, third grade, third grade and the, the slide ended up being uh, partially the reason that my mom and dad moved out of Inkster to Livonia because uh, where we were was a kind of a it, it wasn't a tough neighborhood but it was it was it was unique and so but moving to Livonia uh, I didn't real I came from an Inkster system and it was really good and I, I did well in school but that was all my own, I, you know. I, my, in fact, I don't think my parents, I know they signed my report cards because you had to in those days, bring them home and your dad had to sign them and take, bring them back. Well, the only thing I can remember is how beautiful my dad's penmanship was. <laughs> That's all. He never talked to me about the grades or, or anything. So I, I, I'm not sure where it really came from. I, Oh. Thing. Uh, yeah. there's, there's so much there that like stuff that I could ever been able to do or imagine doing, right? Uh, uh, we both have both have advanced degrees. None of us have advanced degrees. Uh, it's remarkable. We grew up in a really different time, though. We were in a. I mean, I think growing up in it, it certainly had its disadvantages, but you know, being at high school and college in the '60s was, um, if you were capable of doing that. The world was wide open. The yeah. It just didn't feel like the competition was there in the way that it is today. You so. know, if I can add, it was a kind of time where if you wanted to do something, like I hung out, I started to be kind of, I never thought of myself as being a nerd, but uh, there was a group of guys that we wanted to be architects. So we convinced our drafting teacher in the ninth grade that we were gonna start the Draftsman's Guild. And so every, we'd skip lunch and we get to go for a whole hour and draw uh, drafting work. And so that Draftsman's Guild became, he, the instructor made us pens, we got to wear Draftsman's Guild pens. Out of that came the competition for Fisher Body. We used to have to make cars. And we, our school, there was about 10 of us in this Draftsman's Guild. And all of, uh, we all did really well, but two of the guys won full rides from Fisher Body in their cars. Mine, I never finished mine. Uh, I got to a point where I just, it wasn't right. It didn't feel good, so I wasn't gonna finish it. And that, in turn, that car ended up being in Nate's sculpture that I did for him. I cut that car all up in little pieces and like, uh, fixed them to the, the wall. We're gonna put it back together. <laughs> <laughs> and show me how it's done. And then from that, for me, what I did is I uh, competed in the Ford. Ford trade school had a competition for the whole Detroit area and I submitted a bowl that I had made and I, I didn't win uh, a scholarship but I got honorable mention and a postcard. So I still have that and uh, then you know it, it, was a, it was a good time. It was a time where if you, if you wanted to do something you did it and there was a lot of support because the enthusiasm was there. It was probably more hard to, it was harder to focus than it was to do, um, the harder to focus than, than take advantage of everything, you know. I was, say, I, did, I was trying to get to the earlier ages when you were children, but it's, there aren't so many questions that, you know, are appropriate. What I was thinking about is, describe what your high school experience, experiences hmm. were like. What did you do? What is it like? Classes? Okay. I know I should I should probably say it first because once mom starts it's once mom starts it's really going to go. Okay, what, what Pat said? What was our what were our high school experiences like? I, I would say it's a, it was a time of transition for me, huge transition, more from the emotional side than anything else. It was actually to grow up when I when I went there uh, to high school. We started in the tenth grade, and it was a pretty lonely time at the beginning, to kind of sort out where you're going to where you're going to land and that uh, trying uh, sports were new and uh, then moving on into like the 11th grade I started to uh, get the body of people that I ran with and then that was a comfortable really comfortable time uh, and then the senior year I truly became king I, I enjoyed it a lot and uh, we it was a competitive time with all our buddies and 
so it, it became enjoyable, but it also became a source of pride because we did get out of what we thought was a pretty hard high school, and most of our friends did really well in, in the schools that they went to. I had always teased, I had a friend, Tom Friedrichs, who was the son of the principal, and he and I used to sit next to each other in physics and do some crazy things, but he was uh, trying to go to uh, his college that he wanted to go to Stanford, and he tri applied at Stanford and U of M, and I wanted to go to uh, Michigan Tech, and then I didn't care what the other school was, so I had applied another place. And so he didn't get accepted to Stanford. I got accepted to Michigan Tech, so I could say, Tom, I think I won. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so it, it was a crazy time, and it was really an enjoyable time. Lynn? Well, for me, school was always... Um the best part of life in those years. I, I loved elementary school. I loved every minute of school from the beginning to the end, from the, from the academic part to the social part of it to the sports, uh, but everything I was involved in, and I was involved in a lot. Um, anything that came along that was possible to do, if, if, if I could get a ride there and I had, could move it into the schedule, I did it. Um, at one point, my dad looked at the yearbook and he said, well, how come, how come you're not in these academic ones? You're over here in all the fun, fun things. And, uh, and one time my mother said to me, um, I was doing something after school every single day of the week. She said, you have to stay home one afternoon a week. Now, I don't know if that was for her benefit or what I was supposed to do with that one day a week. I have no idea. But anyway, I, ch I quit the church choir. She did not think that was the <laughs> best option. But that's what I quit. And she told me I could quit anything, so that's what I did. Um, no, high school, uh, middle school, I met my, um, my, my best friend, my life, life best friend, Donna Leach, who uh, we're still good friends. We're having lunch next week. Um, and she and I were roommates all the way through Michigan State till, till Jim and I got married, till we got married in uh, our senior year. Um, lots of lifelong friends. I'm on Facebook with many, many of them. And I mean, Livonia was a great place to grow up when we grew up. It was a, a good school district. It was well thought of. Um, one person in particular in the high school was a guy by the name of Dan Webster. And Oh, I could get off on a little tangent here, but um, he was, he ran the, the government, the student council, I guess it was the name of it. And, he was a teacher. And he was a teacher, but he kind of ran the activities, and, and um, he had gone to Michigan State, which was probably why a vast majority of our class ended up going to Michigan State. But he was really a good guy and interested all of us in, uh, in government. And I have been fascinated with watching the the life history and the rise of Hillary Clinton because she's two years younger than I am and grew up in the same, pretty much the same kind of environment. Now she went to Wellesley and I went to Michigan State. There's a big, big gap there. But I understand her. I understand where that drive comes from. I understand how, you know, what she had to go through in, in the years um, since then, since high school, to get and through college to get where she is today, and some of the the, the trials that she's had, um, I've I, it's been fascinating to think about that aspect. As far as sports, girls didn't do sports. There was the girls athletic association, and you could not have the gym any time because the basketball players had the gym. So we would play whatever games or sports we played. We're either outside in the nice weather, or we played in the hallways or or whatever. Um, the only thing you really could do was be a cheerleader, and I was one of those. Um, thoroughly enjoyed uh, every aspect of, of that, even though it's uh, something I don't often admit to to many of my uh, <laughs> <Evolved>. <laughs> children and, and grandchildren. But in, in the day, that's what we, you got to do as far as sports were concerned. I was in great shape. I was probably in the best shape of my whole life. Um, so I loved school. I loved, I loved um, all of the the academic parts of it. Um, and I just always knew that I was gonna to go to college from the time I was in grade school. So it had a real purpose for me, but the, the social part was the, the best part. Um, so I've got a question back to a little bit earlier childhood, because um, it was a big part of our lives, was can you talk a bit about Mullet Lake, Silver Lodge, and what it meant to you and, and your family? Well, we didn't start going to Mullet Lake until I was probably 
seven or eight. When I was younger than that, we went to a place on Elk Lake called Stan Broom's Place, which I've tried to find since then without success. Um, but then uh, somehow when I was seven or eight, my dad found out that there was this um, resort uh, on Mullet Lake called Silver Lodge, and it was right next door to a cottage that he had gone to as a kid. And um, the cottage was then owned by the Altenburgers, but before that it would have been the, was it the Schallenbergers? Schallenbergers, kind of. I don't know, yeah. some family friends of theirs, and he helped build that cottage. And it was right there, and you guys saw it. It was the first white cottage to the right as you were looking at the lake. And then the, the resort developed. So we started going there when I was seven or eight, and Grandma and Grandpa moved one of the cottages over across the road where they lived in retirement when I was probably 17 or so. So they went there for many years. We went the same two weeks every year. All the same families were there all the same kids to play with. Um, a lot of our neighborhood went as well. It wasn't just my family. There were people in the whole neighborhood that went. It was, it was a good time. And I think about you, Pat, all the time because he would get in that boat and he would pull water skiers from the time we'd get up in the morning. And this was his, his two-week vacation. And he would pull water skiers from the time we got out of bed in the morning till dark if it was calm enough to, to do it on Mullet Lake. Um, it, it meant a lot to us. It was a huge part of my growing up as well. And um, I was always glad that they bought a, a cottage there and, and, or a place there and fixed it up for, for their retirement. They lived there till 1995 when they had to sell it. Yeah. Can you uh, talk about your best friend and then why you like that person so much? I had uh, a number of best friends. It seemed like uh, there was periods in my life where I'd hang with, with uh, a fellow maybe for four or five years and then we'd kind of drift away. But probably my best friend was a guy by the name of Zig. And uh, <clears throat> he was a, a son of a, uh, his mom was from Scotland and his dad was from Poland. He was part of the Polish Free Army in the Second World War. And they immigrated to Brazil and his dad ended up being the uh, he, he basically ran the power plant, which meant he ran the town. And Zig uh, had to go to school about 1,800 miles away to a boarding school because there weren't schools for English kids uh, there. So they didn't want that for his sister. So he came to the United States and took a, got a job as a machinist and did that the rest of his life uh, for her. But Zig and I would do wild, we were really compatible. We did the same stuff. We, he played soccer in Brazil, so he taught me how to play soccer. And we used to play that every, all the time. He and I caddied together, and we'd each hitchhike to a, a place called Inkster and Five Mile on our way down to Western Golf and Country Club. And we'd get to Inkster and Five Mile, and we, then we'd decide if we're really going to go into work or we're going to hitchhike down to Detroit. So, and a lot, probably a third of the time we'd go down to Detroit, down to the river, and, and just fool around. Uh, but he, uh, he, his dad, mom and dad influenced him to get a good job out of high school, so he became a draftsman at Ford. And, uh, and stayed in that apprenticeship for about three years, or maybe he finished it, but then he went on to Northern, uh, to get his undergrad, and he did get his undergrad, and that it was the same time that mom and I, no, mm -hmm. yeah, the, that mom and I were up on vacation or something, and visit him, and so I haven't, I've been in touch with him maybe five years ago, maybe a little longer in that, and the chemistry wasn't there. We were both courteous and fun and talk about it, but there, there wasn't chemistry there. So Zig was one friend. Uh, a best friend, high, another friend in high school died uh, two years out of high school of leukemia, uh, and he was he was a really Mike Heckman was his name, and uh, and Tom Friedrichs, and then Tom Friedrichs uh, was good. We had there was a gang of us that we used to uh, <clears throat> we used to like to go to the Gaiety, which was a, a a burlesque in Detroit, and we'd convince them that of course we're. Uh, I think he had to be 18, and all of us were 15, 16, and 17. 
So we borrowed one of the guy's dad's car and just said that we were only going to be around Livonia for a little bit. Well, the Gaiety was way down on Grand River, almost to downtown. And we got in an accident on the way down there. And one of my buddies was Lee Southgate. And he was about uh, six foot three. And he had his front feet under the, fr the front seat. He was sitting in the back. And he kept saying, oh, my legs broke, my legs broke. And we said, get the hell out of the car. We got to get out of here. We were right in the wrong neighborhood. And then he, had one guy had to call his dad and say, we kind of got in an accident. So that was the last of going for the burlesque for a little while. And uh, t so that was really fun. So that was the kind of gang that we ran with. And I, so later on in high school, there was probably six, five or six guys we really hung with. Dude. Well, basically Donna was my best friend forever, um, from seventh grade right through, uh, through college. And, um, and I, I'm not sure why that, that exactly was, because that certainly hasn't been my life since then. I've got lots and lots of really good female friends, but um, and, and the, she was probably my best friend until I yeah, came along. Okay. And, then, and then I think we've been best friends since then, too. But um, we were best friends from seventh grade. Uh, the cool thing about, about my middle school experience was that Donna's mom didn't work. My mom worked. And so the fact that her, she had a stay-at-home mom. So um, we could go there in the summer and have gangs of kids in the basement. And one, win one summer, and her mom always had pot, you know, soda for in the basement for kids and you know her mom was the kind of mom that did laundry every day so if Donna wanted to wear the same clothes day after day after she could you know and that's back in the day we didn't have a lot of clothes so you know and I was lucky if the laundry was done once or a week or every two weeks so there was a, a connection there to her mom that was a really strong one um, but one summer her dad painted all the walls in the basement it was one of those big basements for the day it was a three-bedroom ranch and he painted all the walls white and let us, and then bought paints and let us draw murals. And then if we didn't like it, we'd paint over it in white. And we spent the entire summer decorating the basement. And um, that was certainly a, a memorable time. But she and I <coughs> stayed best friends through high school, through college. And um, our oldest children are three days apart, and our middle children are three weeks apart. And Kurt, when I told her I was pregnant for you, she said, you're on your own. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, in that time period, I'd really like to know more about how you made the decision or how you were invited to, to the, on the Brazil trip. Like, how did that come to fruition? And how was the decision made? And what did it feel like? And did you have any idea? Well, again, it was high school, and oh, there's an opportunity to do something fun. I think I need to do that. Um, uh, Pat was asking what was the, uh, the, the Brazil trip. Well, um, in, in that, at that time, and well, it's still in existence today, existence today uh, there was an opportunity to be uh, an exchange, what they called an exchange student. Exchange students went um, all over the world, and the organization that was um, uh, housed in our high school was the American Field Service and they were the um, ambulance drivers from World War II who put this exchange program together um, in order that there never be another war to get uh, the, 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 the sense of um, global globalism. Well I had absolutely no idea what I was getting myself in for. The app, I, got, I picked up an application, I took it home, I filled it out uh, I'm pretty sure I didn't tell my parents at the beginning. I'm pretty sure I thought, well, this probably isn't going to go anywhere, so I don't need to say anything. Um, it, you had to write essays, and I think of Lexi, uh, our granddaughter, who's writing her college essays. I had to write essays, and I remember one of the questions on the essays was, if you could have dinner with five different people five nights in a row, who would they be? And then you had to write about who they were and why. And, you know, I don't remember what I said, but I'm sure I said people like Jesus and Abraham Lincoln or George Washington or who knows what. Um, but anyway, I got a call that I was a finalist in the program, and um, then I had to wait a very long time to find out where I was going. Well, you know, there was no email. People didn't make phone calls then, so you had to get the letter. So I was waiting on pins and needles. It was probably May, and um, I would be leaving in June, and but still didn't know where I was going. And one day my mom called the school, and, and uh, they called me out of my classroom to go down and talk to her. And 
I thought I'd be going to Europe, you know. It seemed like everybody went to Germany, Germany. or France, you know, Germany. those. And I had, the language I had at that time was a couple of, probably three <clears throat> years of Latin. So that wasn't going to be very helpful anyway. And so um, I found out that I was going to Brazil. Well, I remember the first thought I had was I haven't got any idea. Like Argentina, no idea where Brazil is. So uh, first thing I did was run down to the ge uh, geography classroom in the high school and get out a world map and figure out where Brazil was. Um, but that's how it came about. Not, you know, I don't think there were very many people that applied. It didn't feel like it was really competitive. It felt like it was something that if you really wanted it, you could do it. Um, and, and I really did want it, and I, uh, I was 16, and not too many 16-year-olds had that kind of opportunity to travel. I certainly didn't. What did it cost, and what was it like to get on the airplane, and how long oh, did it take? 24 hours from Detroit to Brazil. We stopped in Peru. Probably stopped somewhere else, too, but there was a big stop in Peru. Uh, I remember it was a 24-hour plane ride. Um, I have no idea what it cost, Pat. I know I had to raise money through the Lions Club and the... Uh, I had to go speak at the Lions Club, and they gave me money, and I get and I, and I had to go back after I was done too. So I had to go before I left and after I came back. Lions Club and probably Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, and so I got money that way. The school probably put some money in. I don't think my parents had to pay anything except my spending money, which wasn't much. <laughs> but you know, there weren't there wasn't calling home or texting home ever. I mean, the whole time I was gone, it was letters. And your dad and I wrote letters every day. Yeah. We had just sort of gotten together that, that spring before I went to Brazil. And then when I came back, he left to go to Michigan Tech. It was fun. Went to Rio. I didn't put that. I want that in there. It was a, a great time. And I certainly loved watching the Olympics this year. And when they would do the, the, the flyovers with the airplanes and show the scenery and I, all the beaches. I lived right on uh, Ipanema Beach. It was quite a, quite a good time, and I'm still close to that family. I've still got their pictures. I wanted to just say, my mother, you know, I said how I wanted to do all the different things. I also took ballet, I took baton, I took piano, I took... Um, a little bit of singing, that didn't go so well. But, you know, those were all things. I never was very good at them. Never. I took swimming. I took anything that came along. I always had my hand up. I was ready to do it. So, um, and that stays true today, too. To today. As your father would say as we were walking five miles to go hear President Obama this morning. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to say something before we start the next section, because you asked about high school. And one of the things that we didn't say is how uh, I met your mom and how what a big deal that was in my life. Uh, I guess I, I knew it then, but I really know it now. Uh, it, was, it was kind of a funny thing because uh, she was, as being a cheerleader, uh, cheerleaders uh, cheered for basketball players and football players. And I was neither. And I used to think my sport was much, much better than basketball and why we couldn't have cheerleaders. So I ignored her and all that. And then one, that was, uh, well, I, you know, she, I got one of the Poppinger looks like this. Uh, <laughs> that, that was, yeah, so, okay. Let me start. Just start we're going to not ramble in your rambling. So I'm that, am, was okay. the, that was the okay. whole <laughs> here, here we go. But what it, it, was, it was really neat. Mom uh, saw me dive one time and then she was in my speech class and she gave the most passionate speech on flower arrangement and I said this lady's got to really be good and uh, that was the start of it and the, the funny thing was I uh, uh, we went to a basketball sock op after I think it was and I had qualified for the state diving uh, meet and it was that way and I was feeling sorry for myself because I couldn't go uh, because I got sick. So I went to the sock hop with mom and probably the best thing ever happened. So, okay, um, so the Vietnam War and civil rights was a big part of your time in that stage. What should we know about that? 
from your perspective? <clears throat> Maybe I should go first on this. Um, that was a really a confused uh, <clears throat> time for our age, my age group. Uh, I was just a little bit older. I was in undergrad when the Vietnam War started, and there was all the protests against going to the Vietnam War, and I was smugly tucked away in engineering school, and they weren't, uh, we weren't going to be drafted in that. Then real and reality hit, it, it, uh, when we graduated, we, we could be drafted, even if we were engineers. But I was able to get a job at Ford with a deferment uh, from uh, f uh, through Ford from the federal government. Well, uh, that didn't work. I was I got draft notice um, there, and then Ford appealed it to a higher level, whatever that means. And we were and about we were we were, we were going to uh, still take that on and, and continue. But then Pat was mom became pregnant with Pat, and at that time that was enough to defer me. So I didn't believe in it. I was scared out of my mind uh, that we would, as a country, get into something that we shouldn't get into. It was, a, it was uh, given to us as us versus the communists, and there's nothing that was black and white. In reality, it was a real gray area. And uh, so it wasn't a happy time for our country. It, wasn't, it was a scary time for me. We lost. Uh, Mom and I were lucky, we only lost, not only, we lost one good friend. Uh, Dennis Beck, who was mom's friend, uh, was killed uh, over there. And so I, and today we're, you're still seeing the results of the Vietnam War and guys that may, may be uh, burned out, maybe homeless, maybe the Vietnam guys are still around. And then there's a lot of them, like Bob Bennett, who came back, he had one of the, the toughest jobs in in the war, he was a, a gunner on a, on a helicopter, and their life expectancy was measured in minutes uh, on that, and he survived the whole thing. So the, the kids that went there, they were fabulous kids. The government that sent them there was really sick. Would you have gone? No. And, um, you know, for me, it was, um, it was so, it, it because of being female, I wasn't going to get drafted. I was involved. I was, you know, I was just engrossed in my own little world and my own little life. But what I do remember was living in an apartment with uh, probably sophomore year in college would have been 1966, 65, 65 probably. And what I remember is we would read the news and talk about Vietnam and about where it was. But I remember what we focused on for whatever reason was how many soldiers were over there. And every month it was so many more and so many more. And we didn't, we didn't know enough to know what the impact of that was gonna be ultimately, but we knew it was gonna be a big part of our generation. Um, with civil rights, um, I was very interested in the whole civil rights movement. And I remember watching all the, the film clips that you see today when they talk about film clips, we saw all that stuff live. Um, because it was a big part of, of uh, what, was, what was happening, certainly, um, well, all, uh, my whole life as I remember it. I remember the first trip I ever made to Florida to see my grandparents and being astounded at the level of segregation that I had no idea existed, no idea. And then, you know, coming back from that experience and understanding that there were a lot of people who didn't live the way I did, weren't as fortunate as I had been. Um, and, you know, we were, we were uh, you know, this isn't, uh, um, I'm not proud of this, but we were busy building our lives, and we didn't get involved. We were busy going to school, having babies, going to graduate school. You know, that was what, the role that we were on, and um, we were supportive of all of it, but uh, not very active at at very many points in time. Can you, can you quickly run through your undergrad timing, location, school, degrees, just really quickly? Mm -hmm. or not really quickly. Well, I, I, I applied to Michigan State, and I applied to University of Michigan, and I applied to uh, Case Western Reserve I got ex uh, in, for nursing. And I got accepted to all of them, and I chose Michigan State. 
and I got that undergraduate degree in 1967. And we were already had been married for uh, the, the two terms, the last two terms I was in school. <clears throat> and um, then I, well, then you tell yours and we'll go yeah. back and forth historically. Okay. You, okay, go ahead. She's orchestrating this. Yeah. But uh, mine was, I, 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 like I said before, I applied to Michigan Tech uh, as the under, my, for undergrad. Uh, the only school I was offered a scholarship from was Mott Community College for diving, uh, but I, cho I chose Michigan, uh, Michigan Tech and was on the swim team there. I did not improve one iota in the year that I dove for them. It was more of a going to Wisconsin and drink, drinking 3-2 uh, beer for the thing. So, um, and then uh, I switched in 1964 to Michigan State. The choice was... Uh, I was leaving Tech. I, it was for lots of reasons. One, it was homesick, lonely. Uh, mom, mom was started. She was at, at the Michigan State. And so the choices were for me to go to U of D in architecture or Michigan State and continue in engineering. Um, and I went to Michigan State because of their mechanical engineering program was outstanding in aerodynamics and slow speed aerodynamics. And that's what I ended up doing. So, and then I went to, for my M, M, well, I tried night school at Wayne for my MBA. Uh, that wasn't working. I was always, uh, ended up working 12 hours a day or six to seven days a week at Ford Styling. We had one car. It didn't work. So yeah, so, so I quit. Uh, I told, I was going to, I told him I'm quitting, and Mom and I had decided on the way up to Dick and Carol Grazley's that uh, that's probably what we should do is quit and go to uh, tech for graduate school. Uh, they wouldn't let me quit. They gave me, uh, they ended up, I got a fellowship. I was the first uh, engineer to get a fellowship in a business school for Ford. And uh, that was really fine because he paid me 25% of my gross salary and all the tuition and all my books and all that. So it was a really, it was a good opportunity on that. So that was... So we got married before either one of us graduated from Michigan State. Dad was there, I was there. He gradu uh, We got married on December 30th, 1966, and Dad graduated in March of 67, yeah. and I graduated in June of 67. So we didn't have a lot of time left in school, but we had no money. I just have to say we had no money. Um, Should I tell her? No, 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 no. Um, <laughs> We, um, there was something I was going to say about them. Oh, uh, just to put it in perspective, our apartment in married housing was $109 a month, which was a lot of money back then. And we were just trying to glue money together to get the finish and get through school. Um, then after Dad went to, then in 1969, you went to Michigan Tech, got yeah. your M mm -hmm. MSBA. And uh, we had made the agreement when Dad went to graduate school that I would get to go too because I really, really... He didn't really want to go, but needed to go. I really wanted to go. Um, I applied to nursing programs, master's in nursing programs, three different times. Um, <clears throat> paid the whatever money you had to pay to, to get, you know, to put in your application. And I just knew it wasn't the right thing for me. And then ultimately um, applied for the uh, MSW program at Michigan and, um, and got in. It wasn't easy because I was a non-traditional student. They really didn't like non-traditional students. But Kurt, you were two, maybe not even, and so you pay. You were about thirteen. You were maybe ten. Yeah. yeah. But it, but but as as a family, mom going to graduate school allowed the, uh, the rest of us to really graduate into a different a different uh, role, uh, <laughs> a different level of responsibility, uh, to support mom as best we could, and I, it was a good time. It was the hard we didn't have money, but no, it was the closet. <laughs> Made the closet into my study. Yeah. Looking back at, at adulthood, so say post college to today, if you could pinpoint the moments that you were that, what would those be? Well, when each one of you were born, yeah, for yeah. sure. I'll double that. Yeah. Um, probably when each of you graduated from high school. And left. And left. And <laughs> no, left. <laughs> no the, the, the accomplishment. Watching you playing hockey, were those were fabulous years. 
I remember I was th on my 32nd birthday. Grandma Poppinger and Grandpa were there for that, for my birthday that year for whatever reason. And she and I were talking, and I remember saying to her, I, I couldn't be any happier with my life. And she said that's what every mother ever wants to hear. So at 32, I was pretty happy. Um, I think that was pre you, Kurt, but oh well. <laughs> we were thinking about you. We were sitting on the deck at, at, um, at uh, Blue Heron. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, how about you? Uh, repeat the question, Mike. Uh, just trying to get a, like, um, and, and I guess I, I'd like to go a step further than when your kids are born. And, yeah. And, but it is the most important. Okay, we'll take that. <laughs> well, we'll take that. <laughs> you got to take it because yeah. that was our only, one of our only goals in life is to have a family and to be able to watch that family evolve. Because that was really, if we, if we ever had a stated goal, that was it. it we didn't have goals like they were gonna, I don't know. It, it was just to have the family, so. And, uh, but I get to tell you my happiest uh, times. Sure, of course. Besides, uh, was the events that we were in with you guys, uh, it was fun, I remember uh, two, two races that we were in. One was with you, Pat, and it was in the Heartland race. Um, and I said, I'm either going to be, I'm either going to beat him or I'm going to be a proud father. I ended up being a proud father. You beat me in that race. <laughs> that was really good. And you, on Mother's and Other's Day, uh, uh, the race up at Flint, you were the only runner that came in with a cut on their finger. We said, how did you get that? He said, I was throwing stones. <laughs> so somewhere during the race you were throwing. So that set, um, it, it really set how, what that race meant to you. It was just an opportunity to have fun, be with everybody. So that, that was a good time. Uh, finishing uh, the, the year, uh, the, the boat, the Charisma that we bought, and I told mom that it would only take us a year to get it in the water. Well, just after seven years of Kurt and I continuously sitting on the boat working on it, we, we launched it, and uh, that was a really good time. Not the charisma. Not the charisma. No, you're absolutely. It was the vintage we call it. The what? A vintage. There was the, the one car, after the Ro, the Rhodes Idler. Yeah. Yeah. So that was a, a good time. A good. Thing. You know, I, it's. I'm very lucky to be able to sit here and say this, but I think we both agree there were very few not wonderful times. Yeah. Very few. I mean, there there certainly were some moments, but on the whole, you know, life life uh, unfolded for us in a in a really um, happy way for the most mm -hmm. part. So, um, kind of going in what Mike said, um, can you elaborate or talk a little bit about what was your your proudest career moment, and then your hardest? Oof. You know my hardest. <laughs> Yeah, maybe I should go through. I had a lot of pride. Quickly, honey. Pride, honey. yeah, a lot of, but my, <laughs> the my, career moments could go on. My pride, proudest was probably getting uh, autofab when I was in with Landris and Bailey, getting that kicked off till we became one of the one of the go-to shops in Detroit for prototypes. And the, the fun of going down and having the press write up about you and, and all that stuff, we did, that was really great. Hardest time uh, that I had was, without going into a lot of detail, was the onset of depression and uh, where I knew that I ended up having to make major changes that would impact mom and me forever and um, deciding that I would leave uh, the opportunity that I had been given by a friend and uh, you know, it was, and selling AVS first. And selling AVS was it, well, was also a result of that 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 period, and um, but you know we teased that we were offered a, a ton of money at, for that time, and so I quit and told mom that that I don't worry I'm going to do it I'll make it and I made forty thousand dollars the next year so that was so we went from what could have been almost a quarter million dollars a year to the forty and that was a, a big dump. So that was a low point, and I, I think for me. But we've both agreed many times over that how life, our life could have been different, but not necessarily in a better way. Yeah, yeah. Because we, we learned a lot, we gained a lot through counseling, through landmark, through a lot of things that made our life um, different but good. Yeah. 
It was just one of those steps along the process, and the end result was I'm in, uh, I personally am in a huge, much better place than I ever thought I'd ever be in, and uh, which is huge. And, and I think the relationship with mom, she's a little tells me what to do sometimes. But. Well, and for me, at, at, um, and we have had long and varied careers that we can't, I mean, you know, we could take the whole two hours up just talking about that. But um, for me, it was really understanding and knowing that social work was where I belonged. Um, never felt as comfortable in the medical arena or in nursing as I did in social work. And um, the, the, the proudest moment had to have been last a year ago, probably last week, um, winning a national award and being the chair of a national committee in my profession, that doesn't happen very often. I mean, never dreamt that would happen in my lifetime. But the rest of it was all good. I always loved the people I worked with. I always enjoyed the work. I never had, uh, 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 well, the, the, the worst time I ever had, and Kurt remembers it well, because I must have been just miserable to live with. I had a boss at the University of Michigan Counseling Center, I will name the place and the time, um, who was just, she was just miserable and made life miserable for everybody who worked there. And seven of us left within a month's time, uh, simply because we just couldn't tolerate the environment. And uh, the, the place is still going. It has a new director, and I'm sure it's um, as good as it ever was. But that was a really tough time, and it was a hard time to find a job. The economy was down, and to find something. And But that's the point at which I got the, um, the huge career move to go to the faculty at Michigan State. So, you know, when they talk about, uh, you know, sometimes the the hardest times turn out to be the best learning and the most important times, it sure was for me. So I have a couple of fun story asks. Mom, mom one side, dad the other. So the first one is, give a quick run through what the family camping trips were like. <laughs> <laughs> and then follow up dad, I need some early coaching stories as well. I, I really have one of the fun co coaching stories. But anyway, uh, the camping trips, Grandma and Grandpa had a Dodge camper van with the thing on the top, yeah. what do you call that thing? And um, and we'd take off in those and go for two or three weeks at a time. And I remember the first time we did it, we said, well, if it rains, we're just going to go to a hotel. And um, But we absolutely loved it. It was so much fun. We I don't think we ever spent the night in a hotel the whole time. Does anybody remember a hotel? No. We, we did the camper van and... and and Dad and I and Kurt, Kurt was from probably two on. Um, Kurt would sleep, we'd all sleep in the camper van and Pat and Mike were in a tent right out. And if it was a scary place, right outside the door <laughs> of the camper so you could go from the camper right into the tent. Uh, Kurt would roll around on the floor and you know, we'd find you in various we'd try places to find you in, in the morning. morning. Um, th those were great times. And um, I remember the last time you went, you were 16, so you were able to help us drive, yeah, but you were good. so bored. Oh my gosh. You were so bored. And you, he, you whittled with a knife a, a log into a flexible piece of chain about this long. Do you still have it? No, I don't have it. But yeah, I yeah. I remember uh, a parking lot in New Jersey. Oh, yeah. That was our very <laughs> first night out. Yep, very first Jersey, night of first trip. For New York City. And we wanted to be close to the city, and there weren't campgrounds. So we stayed. I mean, it was a campground. They called it a campground. And they had those posts where you could plug your, you know, your camper in. Um, oh, it was awful. We didn't stay there, though. I think no. we moved. It was horrible. We we got we left the campground uh, with uh, folding chairs hanging off the back, uh, <laughs> curtains flying, and I knew a yes. shortcut to get out of out of Manhattan through Harlem. So there we drove right through Harlem with uh, the the van. We looked like gypsies. And it was that was fun. But they were really fun times, and we mostly cooked. We ate out some, but we mostly yeah. cooked. And the, I'll, I'll start the, the hockey stories. I remember getting a call from uh, Gary Mitter, you know, on the house phone back in, probably it was, I don't know who it would have been for. Somebody, he had a bunch of boys. And he, was, he, needed, a, he needed a coach. A, a coach. He needed an assistant coach, and he was calling to ask Dad to do that. And I said, sure, I'll do it. <laughs> then I had to go down and tell him he was going to be can, the assistant coach. I know exactly coach. what I was doing then is uh, Kurt, was it Kurt and I? We were down making a boat hook, and that's where you had to put the cedar pole in the water until it floated upright, the handle floated upright. And Mom came down the hill and said, would you go escape with them? You know, I, I think I really did accept for you. I think I really yeah. did. I, uh, that was Other strange. stories, I'm sorry. Other stories were, uh, I think uh, there's some funny stories with kids, but I, the story that I love the most is patience. 
is some, some of the kids that we had at the very beginning, you go, oh my God, there isn't a chance anywhere. And uh, Kent Shoemaker's cousin was the notorious one, Rick. He could not stop. He always dragged his right toe to stop on that. And the, we saw him skate in high school. I think he skated for Lakeland, I'm not sure. But he, he had tendencies to drag that toe still. Uh, it, it was one, uh, there was a guy by the name of Tillman. He was yeah. from with you, and that was the last year I, t I quit teaching hip checks without pads because I hip checked him to show him how to do it, and I thought my leg was going to come off. <laughs> and John Vakirke and I uh, coached together. And Play lot, Rocky in the locker room. And the, probably the highlight was when we got, and I can't remember how old you guys were, and it was your team, I think, we went in the locker room and we decided that we're grown up, 13 years old or whatever the hell we are. So I, we said, well, we gotta have a swear word. What's our swear word gonna be? So I turned to the next kid, he looked down, he wouldn't say it, the next word, wouldn't, nobody would say a swear word that we were gonna have. So John said, I said, John, we gotta have a swear word. What do you think it should be? John said, well, how would damn be? And the kids go, yeah, damn, that's what we can say. And then we said, are we gonna let moms in the locker room or parents? And we decided no. And so the kids, that, so that was fun. Coaching was wonderful with the kids, and the parents were marvelous too. But it was sometimes you just ignored a lot of stuff. Yeah, as Pat knows, it's did not. We, did we go over 100 miles an hour, Mr. Mears? Jet boat? Seventy. 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 Yeah. Still yeah. Yep. <laughs> yep. But you know what, Mike? It, I wasn't it could have been because uh, that's what I remember him saying. Well, what him said and him did is two different things. Yeah. So, uh, are you good? Go ahead. All right, so the one I've got, um, it's uh, back a little bit more family and it's a little more, uh, shows stage in life um, for me. So it's what would you, or what, what would your advice be for families who are in the midst of raising younger children. <laughs> oh, is that loaded? Hang you in there. You, th you think we're going to answer that? You're a crazy. No. It's so simple. Just patience and love. Those two things and accept And it goes by way faster than you ever. I mean, yep. when you're in it, it feels like forever. But it will pass, and they will be cute, wonderful people. Nine and ten year olds, and you know. And, uh, you know, I think when when you talk about advice, you know, just try to be um, as calm as as you can be with them, because I, just remember they remember and are influenced by everything. everything you say and do. And a lot of times you can tell by I'll see actions that I wasn't really that proud of come through. Come you guys are you. doing it. I go, oh God, <laughs> you know. So uh, yeah, just it just. Keep what you guys are doing. So you guys always had a plan. At least that's what you told us. We lied. How did that come, how did that come through? Like there was always some, like after the fact, you guys had come through with some sort of plan or some sort of thoughts or how, and, and was that like normal course of your discussions or was it just like you would think about things, it seemed like you always had steps and plans. For us anyways. I can, I, can I start that? That okay. one of the things, well, we, we always ate together, and always at the end of the dinners was time to drink a cup of coffee and sit and talk. So that was a sure thing that we'd have that, and we'd talk about usually the calendar and then stuff that would go in the, in the future. Um, I don't think we had big master plans that, that you're gonna- I was just hoping to get through the next day most well, of the time. Well, yeah, and- uh, uh, I'm not sure. I know and what keeping, you mean. yeah. Well, there was examples like um, we would make family decisions. We would have oh. have a, like we had like there was always a time when you'd go and you'd look back and you're like, well, obviously that worked or it mm -hmm. didn't work. And I was trying to think of examples, but it was you know um, I don't know. It just seemed like there was generally. You guys were of the same opinion for the most part. Yeah. A lot of and, talking. You know. Yeah, to, to resolve the difference. We didn't show the differences, I don't think, our differences, 
to you guys that much. If something had to be debated out or worked out, that usually was done, you know, so you couldn't see arguments and, stu and stuff. But uh, they were there. Um, but, and yeah, also and the you, commit... You all know the areas in which we disagreed about things. Yeah. But we, you know, I think we'd, we would try to... What were the disagreements? Oh, oh and money. And how to raise you? Oh. Cool. How you, who's, how are you going to finance college? You know, I did it myself. I'm not paying for those kids. I didn't pay for a thing. Yeah, and so <laughs> therefore the the bridge between, you know, me and mom was huge. Uh, not to hit you. Uh, that was a huge thing that uh, mom told me if if I ever hit one of you kids, she's leaving. And I uh, said it'll never happen twice. It'll never happen twice, mm -hmm. and. And I, I, was the one. I, <laughs> I think I hit. I wasn't gonna go there. I, I think I wrapped one of you guys in the head with my That's knuckle. Mike. Was it you, Mike? Well, let's just say mom didn't know about all the <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, but so that was coming from my environment to mom's. There was a really good blend. Yeah, I, mean, we were, I mean, I think any couple, you're raised differently, so you're gonna have those differences, and you gotta find a way to work through them. And. You know, you hope that you, you come out with, between the two of you, the best solution. A, a later one was, you know, college and what our commitment and how much, we, you know, we're going to commit to that. So that was, and we, we learned through each one of you. Each of the approach we took with you was different than yours and was different than yours. And that's just an evolution. So you got you got jumped. <laughs> you wanted. You know, second part. So it just I I would just curious. Now you're technically retired, right? Mm -hmm. So looking back, if you could go back and do a different career, what would you choose? Let's say you have to. Yeah, I think I would have done more things, because I think, surprise, <laughs> no surprise, right? Yeah, surprise, right. Um, you know, I, I stuck, I mean, Grandpa worked for, for Chrysler for 40 years, so that was my model. And I worked, you know, at the same things. I kind of stayed at jobs a long, long time, um, the last one, 25 years. And, and that probably was a good one. But in that middle part, I probably should have moved around more, tried more different things. And, and I said here earlier, and, and maybe it's the Hillary Clinton getting elected hopefully tomorrow, um, that politics would have been something I'd been interested in doing at some point. But I don't know where or where the time would have come from. I don't know. You? Mine is, uh, there's different stages in my life. And one of the things, if I, I would like to have gotten through the depression, knowing it was gonna come and that I could get through it and it was gonna be okay, that would, that would add another element. And then when I was in the corporate world, uh, to really realize um, that it is viable, that I am, that I am good, that I'm that not so insecure. And because I think there would be a lot of really good opportunities incorporate there were, and but I didn't realize it. I didn't realize when I was on a fast track, and so got out. And then I loved owning my own companies. Uh, so at a different time in my life, I would have liked to have had to stayed with probably an engineering company. That was just so much fun. And then uh, in the last part of my. Uh, life, it would be to figure out somehow, some way to give back uh, a lot more than I did. And w whether it's build <laughs> Voyager canoes with a bunch of kids or, or what. So uh, you guys have been through a lot of it with me. And it was really, uh, you, three of you were instrumental a lot of times in me establishing a new approach. I remember I wrote, one time wrote you a letter. He says, hey, I'm thinking about a new job. What do you think? <laughs> so, yeah. What, what year did the depression start? How old were you? Nineteen ninety-five. Nineteen ninety-four. Yeah. 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 I was probably... So, 50. I was probably in my mid-40s. And that, yeah. But I did a, one of the things is when, when you have depression, you don't know you have depression. You don't want to know it and you become really good at faking it, and so you fake it sometimes, so I myself didn't know.
that time. I so, sure didn't know. So it was, and then it all came to a head, and uh, there was Sam, and uh, and then Mom, and so that that was, it was about probably five to ten years that we take out of the the fast track. So and it's, and it's also something I wanted so much for you guys to know that I, that depression is real, and it's you know. Um, so to look for the signs and watch for it. But I, I mean, no part of it can be hereditary. But I, I, you know, but also, I mean, we can mm -hmm. we can go back and point to the things that probably were uh, instrumental in from the, the 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 nurturing side of things for for you. Sure. Right on, positive, okay. Right? Yeah, yes, let's move away positive. from that's that. gloomy. Yeah, that's gloomy. Who has that? Again, I. How we doing on time? We're at forty-five. Oh my gosh. We only have one more section. Yeah, one more section. Okay. I was just saying for the record, like, I can't remember how many marathons you did. Seven. Was it seven marathons? Seven yeah. marathons. Were all Detroit or did you do All Detroit. Marathon? Detroit was a flat course. <laughs> <laughs> cool weather. Yeah. And then uh, did marathons when it was just kind of fun to do the marathon. Uh, probably four, three years I tried to be competitive. Uh, and get some time, and I was happy with what happened. And, but then at the end, the last marathon was really just a, a training run that hurt. Can <laughs> um, I ask one more? You're sitting upright, Let's and it's go. scary. Yeah, well, <laughs> um, yeah. So it's basically pretty simple. Um, what were some of your favorite memories of being a parent? Oh, that's easy. My fa mine is pride. My memories of of pride in you guys um, just uh, is what it's all about. Uh, that that was uh, and and you you all did really wonderful things and you did goofy things and I was just as proud of of some of the goofy things as we were of of your accomplishments. Well, yeah, it got accomplishments across the board and certainly sports was a big part of that, but academics and. Yeah. And, and things you were interested in, the ways in which you, you treated people, and... Um, the parents that you are. Yeah, and all the way through your own relationships and your own parenting, and, you know... That's how, I think that's how we're evaluated. In the long term, is how you guys really, because our job was to be a role model. I need to follow up on that one, though, because I think it's probably one of your most interesting parental decisions was around sending Mike on the boat, and and that scenario, and Jeez. and how that went down, and how amazingly that turned out. Right? You know, there are just some things, uh, and I guess this is lungs in the wisdom section. But I was thinking about this the other day. They're just okay. I, what happened was um, what year, 1986 or so. Um, I was driving to MSU in my long 55 mile one way commute and listening to NPR radio, and there was a guy by the name of Jim, somebody from MSU that was on the radio, talking about this uh, class afloat. Tord Sundstrom. Yep. Huh? Tord Sundstrom. Sundstrom. Yep. And he was talking about this, that he was going with this group, and they were going to take a tall ship from Nova Scotia to... Um, we thought it was around the world. Where? Sing Singapore. Singapore. And it was just so... It was just, you know, one of those, I, I, I was glued listening to it. So I got to work and I called the guy because he was just across the street on campus. And I called him and he was telling me about it. He said, do you want, do you want some information? And I said, sure. And I, he, he mailed me through campus mail the information. Three days later, the mail comes and I took it home and I put it on the counter. And Steve was there as always for dinner. And I said, anybody interested in this? And I was talking about it and that, zero interest. I mean, everybody's just looking at me like, are you crazy? Um, and, you know, I, it was just one of those things I think both of us knew from the minute we heard about it that if any one of you guys wanted to do it, whoever wanted to do it, we would support it. Um, yeah. And, and certainly... And, we'll, and bonuses were good that year. Yeah, we had so a little was, bit of money. I mean, you know. And, uh, and then what happened? Mike <laughs> went. <laughs> <And> then, <laughs> Oh, well, he, in uh, the summer of 86, he boarded the boat, 86 or 87, maybe 87, the boat up in Nova Scotia, a tall ship with Lewisburg. 22, Lewisburg, Nova Scotia, with 22 
kids? 44. 44 kids, 22, 22 20. girls, 22 boys. And it was a, a schooling ship, and they sailed from um, Nova Scotia to Singapore from between the July 4th weekend and Christmas. Christmas. So they were gone that whole time. And there was one period of time for five weeks that we didn't hear from you. And every parent had their own fears. Somebody had fears of sharks. And I was, I was afraid that you were going to, you know, because you were one of the youngest kids on the, on the boat. I was, my, my worry was that you would get yourself in trouble socially with, you know, with the kids and not be yeah. accepted, huh? Which, yeah, yeah, but you didn't. But so um, that's the romantic version of the story. <laughs> <laughs> there was a moment. There was a when moment. I wasn't no, yes, sure. there was. And you guys went through a process to decide to let me go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Talk about that. I think that's that, a, a that very was very powerful way to be dealt with that. Well, I, I'd like to say that it was this will be the intellectual thing that I wished it would have been. And what really had that's where Michael decided that he was going to go to a bachelor party before school. And in the park. In the park. And they went the, before school and got drunk. And then and went to school that way. And, and went to school, and we got a call from Bruce Gilbert. And Bruce said, I think your boy is... Uh, it's a principal. Yeah, I think he's... Uh, he explained. So we said to Mike at that time, we briefly... I called Mom, and I was working with Cleve King at the time, and I said, Cleve, i got to go. And uh, we met at Big Boys down at... Uh, and decided what we'd do, and we decided that you had just spent your... You were really saying to us, no, you didn't want to go and in your way. So we decided, okay, that's his decision. He decided he didn't want to go. Well, the member, uh, uh, Biggs, Biggs, Mary Biggs, uh, what's your, Mary it was Biggs. Mary Biggs. Right. Yeah, she was the director. And so we called and talked to we her. We called and talked to her. And she said, well, let me call you back. She called back and she t took the higher road and said, he was just telling you, meaning you, Mike, you were scared, and uh, she says he has every right. Not uh, I'm paraphrasing, I think, every right to be scared. But in reality, there's nothing to be scared of. Just uh, we ask that you let him go, and uh, so then mom. But we were really clear. We were really clear with you too about the fact that you know that it was going to cost a lot of money, and that you had to make this a success, and that if you, I think we might have said. Tell me if this is wrong. Your, not, your memory might be different than mine of it. But mine was, I remember saying, you know, you could, we're, we're going to let you go in spite of the getting in trouble. But should you get in trouble on the boat and get sent home, which is what they said they would do if kids drank or got in trouble, to the extent that you got sent home, you had then spent your college money. Do you remember that? Because that mom and we talked a lot. Something like that. Yeah. And, and to me, that was, uh, you know, I don't know what we would have done. But, but yeah. that was, that was the, that was, that was it made me feel better. Didn't you put a group of people together to talk about it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. See, that's the, that's the, yeah. to me, that's the cool yeah. part of the story. Yeah. You, you brought your friends together. We talked about it with just about everybody. Well, we, we, it was actually like a study group. We brought them and we explained, and, and Steiners were involved in that, and, when and they all, to, to the a person. couple, to a person, said that Mary Biggs was right. That you should go. That you should go. And so, uh, oh, it was so right. It was, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and so that was that was a yeah. what? <laughs> <laughs> Got a little side conversation yeah, going the, over here. But that was yeah. our, our parenting style. We when we get to some point where we did. But you know, know, we kind of did that with I think with with a lot of stuff and I had a lot of really cool people in my life at that time because I was working by that time at the Counseling Center in Michigan all that whole Ann Arbor group of people most of them were therapists and so I had a lot of people I could count on to give me good supportive advice Evie and Penny and those those people well and it, and it, it wasn't just Michael and the boat it was I remember Patrick you wanted uh, you had a spirit the car and uh, you tried to polish it into being a Porsche, but no, it was hard. no matter how hard you rubbed it, it, it stayed a spirit. And I remember you found this old Porsche and you wanted to buy it. And I said, hell no, there's no way that you'd buy it. And so this went on and, and you did a good job of not revolting, but you continued uh, asking. 
Well, I was out to lunch with one of my friends, and I said, hey, I need some help on this, and it was Jim Dillon, uh, and I explained the, what the situation was. And he said, Jim, I think you're an asshole. I said, what are you talking about? He said, is he a good kid? And I said, yeah. Is he doing well in school? Yeah. He says, you really have no right. And I said, it's my car, the Spirit. He's going to use the money for the, your Porsche for that. And he said, that doesn't matter. So then we went home and we, let, we said, okay, go. And then, God, we lived with that horrible decision. You, 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 you took your younger brother. You uh, you'd drive this Porsche to the hockey games with no heater. And you wore, at that day. The headlights would freeze. And you wore those, those coats that just looked cool, that weren't warm. And the two of you would drive down in 59, so Mom and I, a lot of times, would make sure we were behind you so you didn't know that we were following you. So we could go. So it was, I'm sorry. And I, I'm trying to think of a similar situation with you, and I think it was when you were in Australia. Or Austria, sorry. I've done that more than once. When you were in Austria, as an ex Kurt was an exchange student in the same program I had gone on. And I went in 1962, and you went in 1995. And... Um, the first family didn't work out so well, and <laughs> to say the least. And we just, you know, we talked about it and talked about it and finally just trusted that and told you, we just trust whatever decision you make about leaving. But there was plenty of pressure being put on us by the, the bad family to, that you were supposed to get in line and do it their way. And uh, that was the most stressful thing I think we ever had with decision making. How, how proud we were yeah, when, it when, all worked out. when uh, we found out you advocated for yourself what we thought happened is you took on the family and AFS and moved off to another family, and that family you, you seemed to like a lot. So that was a really good time, but it was hard to sit there and not blow up because that other family was where they were creepy. <laughs> if you could thank each one of your parents for one thing, what would it be? Uh, the question is, uh, thanking our parents for one thing, what would it be? And um, what immediately came to my mind is I would thank my dad for being the best dad there ever was. And I would thank my mom for her encouragement and support and and um, a high level of expectations because I think that helped me end up where I ended up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, if I had to thank my parents for one thing, my mom, what I would thank her for was um, the faith she had in me when I was uh, in my teenage years. And uh, I had thought that went away later on, but it was really important because it, in, in combination with what my dad gave me is an example of what I thought a man should be. And, and um, so I thank him for that even though that was part of the issue that I had to relive or redo, um, it was important at the time. I know instantly who that is from. Oh, the question is, who were our role models? And in the, the psychological world, you call, call that internalizations. What, who are the people you've internalized that you depend on when you think about things and you make decisions? And um, and for me, that would be uh, my my uh, graduate level field instructor when I was learning how to do therapy, Penny Trotman, because forever with you guys or when I was in a therapy session or with you or with, with anybody, I'd think, well, what would Penny say here? And I would all, I would know. I would know what she was going to say. But I think then both of my parents were also those internalized role models at their, in their own ways. Um, and probably lots, I think, for me, I think I picked a lot of little things from a lot of different people over time, which I think is a good way to go because then you've got a lot of options. Yeah, I would agree with Mom as far as who was instrumental or my role models. It is... Uh, there's a ton, but I think the three, um, one was my grandfather Fitz, to see how he could carry, and, and a lot of how I tried to grandparent now is a lot that I learned from him. 
Uh, so another role model would be uh, actually my dad. Uh, in earlier day, earlier days, uh, and late in, uh, is the therapist I had. His name was Sam, and and we still use Sam sometimes. <laughs> Uh, our coffee pot on the boat, we drew a uh, picture of Sam on it. So when we get to the point and could say, what would Sam say? We turn to the coffee pot and somehow it gets worked out. And shall it be no surprise our dog is named Sam? <laughs> <laughs> so in continuation of that, one of the things from uh, you know, what you hope to pass on your kids, how did you guys make the decision for John and Judy as godparents? Hmm. How did we make the decision for John and Judy as godparents? Can, can you actually talk oh. We're, yeah. If we were back one section, adulthood, uh -huh. John and Judy was a big part of our growth. Yes. Yeah. Can you talk about them and the relationship? Sure. So I'll repeat the question. Um, the question is uh, the impact or how John and Judy were involved with us. And, uh, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a relationship that grew. It started from married housing up at MSU. John was a mechanical engineer. Uh, and he was one of the young, a uh, year younger than me, so he was in an all new program. So he was one of the young guns, young guys, and we were some of the old guys. And uh, that friendship uh, was, was okay, it, it wasn't much. Well then, uh, later on, maybe 10 years um, later, we decided to find John and Judy, because kn I knew he had been out in Milford somewhere. So we did, and our our relationship, uh, th their goals in life were a lot like ours. Their philosophy, their religion, and all that weren't contrary to us. I think that they loved you guys uh, an awful lot, John especially. And uh, you, uh, we also knew that you needed other mentors than us. And they, they uh, represented that. They're not too much different. It was like when Mike and Sandy were there. They were a little bit more, a little bit more differenter, but uh, so uh, that that's how John and Judy just fit the bill. You know, I think it's it's. Uh, I I would just add um, that they we they weren't good friends of ours in college, but for some reason we were very drawn to them. And then when they couldn't have children, our sharing you guys with them, they were grateful for the opportunity, and we were certainly grateful for the support. Um, to have another couple that would, you know, we talked about over every, and still do, uh, Judy's my walking buddy. I walk three miles five days a week with Judy, and we still have conversations about all of you, and so. your name, Kurt, is because of John. John named He him, was, yeah. John, John did. Is, yeah. is it true that when you started your business, they committed to support our college if the business failed? Mm -hmm. It was, all, I, I don't know how yeah. spoken that was, but it was assumed, yeah. yeah. For sure. They, That's like crazy. they said that they would assume uh, some of the risk, and we never talked about how much that was or what college that was. But you, when we were going, you were at K and you were at a Midland, and both needed a chunk of change each year. And John and Judy said that if if we stumbled at AV, at AVS, you would you would pick it up. They were my financiers. Yeah, a lot of the yeah. a lot of the cars. That's Porsches. They actually wrote some checks to you. Yeah. Did you pay them all back? I did. <laughs> that would have been another issue. You know, that would have been very important. I mean, the, and he was such an athlete, such a he uh, to the opposite extreme of me. He would drive himself just crazy, you know, with broken arms and all that, and doing stuff he shouldn't be doing at 40 years old and 50 years old. So, I do. I do believe they'll be they'll be offering you some support in your old age as well. <laughs> um, so, back to wisdom a minute. Um, one of the things that I think, uh, at least in my sort of early adult years, um, you guys were very good at giving advice on sort of which path to take. I had a couple of paths that uh, came about, and I think what I would like for you to elaborate on. What I wrote here is what what wisdom would you give, for example, a great great grandchild as they progress into adulthood, but may not have a clearly defined path. A great great it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Just the, and, and it's almost like it's away from you. Somebody we don't know that. Repeat the yeah. question. Yeah, we should open the train. Yeah, don't mind. Okay. Oh. Oh, you get some time. Okay. Yeah. 
I think. I know what you'd say. Yeah. See, I don't even have to answer. She knows what I'm going to say. Mean, Talk about the, in, uh, incorporation. Of part of the, the reason for this question is, you know, I think we all figured it out at this point, but there's going to be kids that hopefully watch this and um, oh. may not have, you know, may not be, they're not going to be in the same place as we are. And they may need some grandfatherly, grandmotherly advice for some okay. Oh, we all okay. said? And they, uh, you want to do it? Go ahead. Question. Uh, yeah, the, the question was, what kind of advice would we pass on to the next generation or the next and the next generation if someone really didn't know where their focus was? Is that pretty much? It, uh, it depends on how their age. Uh, if it was they were older, I could give them input. But if they were younger, it would be them and their parents because it's a combination of both. Well, I would like to know if they're, what you would give them. My, my thing is just believe in yourself. I just... Believe in yourself, and no matter what you do, uh, everybody's going to love you. And if you can, if you can, we always say find your passion. And I tell them I really don't know what that means, but find out what you really like to do, and then go do it. And um, I would, I would uh, tell them to have faith in yourself. I would just add to that that I think. Um I would say that you know life is long if you're lucky, and if you're lucky and life is long, you get to do a lot of different things. So don't be afraid to follow a path. If it doesn't work, you'll figure something else out. And um, and to to try to I wish I had done more things than I did, and I've done a lot, but there are some things that I wish I had done. And so so why not um, why not. Why not do that? Why not give yourself those? Uh, get a good, you know, I would say get an education. Get a good I would always say that because I, I believe whether you actually ever use that per se in a, in a profession or not doesn't really matter. But it's the confidence that it builds. It, it's a time of getting you from 18 to whatever. Um, uh, so I would say that. But beyond that, whatever happens, whatever works for you, um, try things you've never, you never thought you'd want to do. And I'm trying to tell myself to do some of those things right now. How's it going? Not so well. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, if you could have dinner with anybody tomorrow night, mm -hmm. who would it be? That's easy. Not, not a media fan, but let's take that. Oh, okay. I was going to say, you guys have some <laughs> historical figures. Yeah. Or maybe people that are living too. But let's, let's keep it independent of uh, family and friends. Basically. Okay. Uh, no, and then, and then I, I think the, the bigger, the, the, the more interesting question is not who it is, but what would you ask them? Mm -hmm. And why would you, why would you answer that person? The question is, if we could have dinner with anybody tomorrow night, um, who would that be, and why, and what would we talk about? And that's Tuesday night, and that's the election. Right. You, you, so. Well, for me, it'd be Hillary. Yeah. Tomorrow night, I'd love to be having dinner with Hillary. There would yeah. be nothing I'd like better. Um, then, and, and what I would talk to her about is how tough it's been. And um, what I would want to do is offer her the energy and all the energy and support I could possibly offer her as she steps into this new arena in her life and all of our lives. Yeah, and an interesting dinner at the next table would be if I had Donald Trump there <laughs> and having, having dinner with him. Because I think there's going to be, uh, we're going to probably see the, the best case of denial that we've ever seen. But no, he's not, he's not one. There's, a, there's an author that I've been reading I like. His name is Evans. And he's written a, a book about uh, walking from Seattle to, uh, to uh, Key West, the Key West, uh, as, a, as a therapy, the, the, a self-imposed therapy after his life fell apart in Seattle. And it's really, really fascinating. I'd like to be, have dinner with him and say, you know, tell me how much of this is your life and, and all that. Then that, my other would be my grandfather Fitz. The, well, we can't do family, so there you go. He said media family. Yeah, that's pretty much media. Yeah. Well. No, he's dead. <laughs> Immediate means alive. Uh, no, but I think the point of that is is to, it, my, what first came to my mind would be my parents. You know, the, having that last conversation that you never, you, mm -hmm. you couldn't have, you know. Wouldn't they love this? I yeah. say that so much. Well, not so much this. I just wish my parents uh, didn't have so many constraints 
on them emotionally and, and whatever to see what genetically has been created, not by them, but down through the ages. Because you walk in and, and you look at, like it came through at the, the uh, Frankenmuth dinner, to, to see this, this what, three, three generations down or four, uh, how wonderful these, these people are. And uh, there, were, there was so much opportunity for them to, ha to, ha to see this, but they couldn't do it. They couldn't see it, and uh, I, w I would like to be for them to. And, but I know, I get back in the same old stuff with my mother and <laughs> shit. And, and so. I have a good lead in for that one. Um, we haven't talked much about it, and in your adult life, and transitioning to wisdom, the adventure portion of your life has to be one of the biggest things that, will, that hopefully people will remember and how do you keep that going, and what makes you do it, and how do you decide to do it, and you know, what do you get from it? Adventure, I think it, adventure changes per each phase well, of life. Yeah, oh, so the question is, um, how does adventure play into our life, and, and in, more importantly, into our future? And what was adventuristic at 35 would kill me now, and, but, there, there, for me, I've thought a lot about it because there's a really a high degree of uh, blending fear with accomplishment. And sometimes, I don't know if it's fear of failure or fear of getting hurt or whatever, but I like the feeling and it, it's, uh, it's allowed me to, to do lots of stuff. Uh, fear of starting a business when you got two kids in undergrad and all of those kind of that 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 was probably the biggest adventure I ever did the sailing the boat that's that's really fun that that adventure has allowed me to appreciate what I have up north in you guys that's that's really big and Bike riding is yeah, how to get from A to B. Well, you know, when when we were young, I mean, I think that was my biggest attraction to your dad was um, I knew it was going to be an adventuresome life. I knew that we were going to do fun stuff, that we weren't going to be sitting around. And when, I, when we dated and we didn't have any money and we were in high school, we'd come out to the airport. There was no security. There was nothing. You could walk out. We'd, we'd go out and we'd make up stories about all the people at the airport and watch the people saying goodbye and who they were saying. I mean, we, would, we could have... We'd, it was our Saturday night entertainment and we spent many about 98, times. 98, and it was all right. Yeah, with the gas to get to the airport, which wasn't much. So I think um, for me, you know, life has been an adventure from the very beginning, and so in, in some ways, but we, it, they've all been calculated adventures. You know, they've not been things where. You know, we moved a lot of, I mean, we wanted to stay in this area. We wanted to stay near where we have friends and we have family. We, um, that, those were conscious choices where adventuristic would have been to move to wherever and, you know. Um, but all along the way, we've chosen to do, uh, especially in this, I mean, what would you do with the third stage in your life if you didn't have some adventure? I mean, I can't imagine if we weren't but riding bikes across Europe or being in a sailboat. I mean, what would we be doing? Huh? Scrapbooking. Scrapbooking. Scrap no, I, taking care of grandchildren, which yeah. we love to do, but I don't want to do that 24-7 either. It, it almost goes back, if I can interrupt for one little bit, is uh, a lot of the stuff we do, our adventures and stuff, are a blend of mom's approach and, and mine. And so she does a really good job of tolerating a little bit of me, and I can do a little, do, I do okay with, with moms. And... Uh, so the end result is really a, a neat thing that neither one of us probably would have pick, picked by ourselves, you know. Well, the thing I learned in Landmark was, uh, uh, in, that, in that regard, was that, um, I'm not going to state this well, I was going to think about this more than I have, but the notion that making the people around you the happiest they can yeah. possibly be, because in return you get everything. And it took me a lot of years to figure that out. And that, um, so while maybe it wouldn't be my first choice to go sailing, it would be my first choice to go boating. So to go make you happy and be on a sailboat makes me happy. Okay. And we have had a ball. I mean, I don't know how we could have more fun. Mm -hmm. I don't know if this question's gonna go anywhere. I was looking at, um, you brought up 
brought over the photo album of, I think, when I was two or yeah. something. And I was looking through that photo album, and I came across the picture, and we were on vacation somewhere. But it wasn't in Grandma and Grandpa's van, it was in a vanigan. A vanigan? A vanigan, yeah. yeah. So there's a picture of a, <laughs> of a VW bus with a family. Behind it, you were towing the sailboat, the cruise. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And we were off who knows where we were, right? Yeah. And you look at that picture, and I think there's a lot of people today, now, think of, they, they want that life. They want the, the VW bus, and they want the family and pulling the sailboat. Sure. And all that. So in them talking about adventure, I think the question is, as a family, when you were in that world, what were you, pro- how did you define it? And what were you sort of proud of in that moment of being a family? If, if hard situations were going to come up, did it, obviously I didn't put a lot of thought into it, but um, I guess I looked at that photo and I said, you know, if I didn't know you, I would think that that was a cool family, right? I guess the question is, did you see yourself as a cool family? Is that something you even wanted? Was it, what yeah. were you trying to, what, I I guess, what was the feeling you were trying to live in? To restate the question is, <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm trying to do. It is when Kurt saw a picture of of us and pulling a, a boat down the road in, in a in a van again. Uh, were, were we trying to f- fulfill an image? And I really, I was looking forward to the adventure that we were going to have, whatever that was. Uh, I re- and I a lot of times I didn't care what anybody thought of me or of us. Um, but I was just doing what I really wanted, and I was with the people that I really wanted to with be with. With the money we had in the moment. And with the money we had in the moment. And we generally would spend everything we had, and uh, because we used to play a game with those young pink slips or the yellow, <laughs> yellow slips the yellow from Visa, slips. see how many we could well, collect. The picture that comes to mind is a yellow Schwinn loaded down with 940 <laughs> Yeah, and it, it's those kind of things. I, I didn't care that people thought I was abusive. And I had one lady tell me that I was abusive. To, you put a three-year-old in the back of that bike, and you pulled him where? And, That's, but, uh, and the, the story behind that was I was in grad school, and it was exam week, and I said, you just got to take these kids and get out of here. And you took everybody and put them on bikes and drove from Grandma and Grandpa's house on Mullet Lake um, up to Mackinac Island. To Cedar. To Cedarville. Cedarville. Um, and you did some other of those trips, too, but um, I got to miss those. <laughs> <laughs> But though, and in my mind, those are some of my best memories of just putting that stuff together and living it. I love, you know, my still my favorite meal is honey and carrots. I just, I just love it. What? Well, that was cool because we uh, we were gonna go into town on Beaver Island, and uh, we asked you and Rod, if you wanted to come with us, and I think you said no. And I said, well, we had to get something to eat, and you came with me, and I said, what do you want to eat? And you said, honey. And I said, well, we should have some vegetables. So we got some carrots, and we had honey and carrots. That's all we ate, and that was cool. You and know? that was the Dean Dermeyer. Oh, God. Mike's friend didn't get to go, because he came, They were getting, everybody was getting ready to go, and he came to the house, and he's sort of green. And his mom, he's the youngest of four or five boys, and his mom said, yeah, he can go, he can go. And he, he's not looking good, and I felt his head, and he's burning up. And I said, you know what, I, I think this isn't a real good idea for Jim to be responsible for six boys, one of them who was sick. And as it turned out, Dean Dermeyer had spinal meningitis in, in, the, in the moment. Yeah. So it was, yeah, he's fine. Let him go. Let him go. Let him go. <laughs> so maybe the, the biggest adventure that I see that you guys have been on is your relationship with each other. Yeah. Uh, you haven't been married for 50 years and tolerated it. You've been married for 50 years and really built something very special with each other. And we feel ancillary to that, which is the way it's supposed to be in my opinion. So... What would you say if you're talking to Lexi? Uh, I'm only thinking of her because she's going into adulthood, yeah. uh, or us, I guess, uh, in terms of marriage, relationships, partners, life partners. What makes that work? What have you seen make that work in your friends, uh, peer group, and then what's worked for you guys? 
Well, I would go back to what I said earlier about the real, oh, the question, what, what have we done to make it work? And every year it's something slightly different because I think you don't know. It is an adventure and you're walking into it, but you, you walk, I think we've tried we haven't always been all that successful, but we've tried to walk into whatever is going on um, with the notion that we're going to figure it out. I mean, we are, we're not going to give up. We never felt that. Um, I, and I, I mean, I think there are certain circumstances you do walk away where it, it isn't going to work, and that's all right, too. But we felt like we could make it work, and, and, and we did. And um, as Marty Cope would say, you know, he said, I've been married to seven different Sallies. And, <laughs> and we've certainly been married to several different Jim and Joannes along the way. But you, I don't know. I, you know, that's a really hard question. But what the realization that I got is that when I make other people around me happy, then I'm happy. Not because I'm giving in, because believe me, I don't give in. But because I know that I'm doing my part in the relationship, whatever, yeah. in whatever circumstance it is. And for me, I, I could say all the things of have respect and have love and have all that. But I think for me, the thing that, that was most important is I'm from, uh, from an environment, my folks, where there was no such thing as not making it. You made it. And there was a, a, a lot of times there was uh, things where with mom and the arguments, it wasn't generally about mom and me. It was about my growth. And, and how, you know, I was learning. And, uh, and she's my best teacher that I ever had. Uh, Likewise, that goes both ways. And, uh, and one of the things that was, and one of the landmark discussions that I, that I walked away from and said, oh, it's kind of simple, is, you know, it, it, the marriage is 50-50 is what they say, and then, uh, that's never worked. The marriage is 100% zero. I give 100%, she has to give zero. And the end result of that is just phenomenal because you get back in spades uh, much more than, than you give. So, and then the luck plays a big part of it. Just being out and out lucky to come in that uh, that disaster didn't happen and they could have happened or that accident didn't happen or you guys didn't get brain damage or, or anything, you know, that'll tear a couple apart. Um, so we were lucky. We've been very fortunate. Yeah. We're grateful. I think that's another, we talk a lot about how, what we're grateful for. It's a part of every conversation. And, and we certainly have a lot to be grateful for. Yeah. But it puts you in a plane of, of um, you, knowing that things could go wrong and they could go wrong tomorrow. But for right now, we're having a ball. And how you handle it. Yeah, it was good. And let me go down to Florida for two weeks and work on my boat as much as I want. <laughs> Whew, doesn't get much better now. Because what goes along with that, though, that I don't think anybody understands is how much work you put in. How do you quantify or how do you share what that's like in marriage and in life and in raising kids and in work and in? Because I think there's a huge learning <laughs> that goes with that. Uh, it's uh, every day. Uh, the question was how, how much work. Well, just how do you quantify or how, how can you share how much work that is? Well, I think when you're young and in your guys' age, you'll get to sleep when you're dead. So don't worry about being tired. It is, it, it's a tiring job being a mom and dad. And uh, just wait till later. You'll sleep. And uh, oh, I, I don't know. But how, what, our so how many hours did you work? How, like, again, those are things that people... Oh, you know, my work, work? Whatever, you know what I'm saying. Like, yeah. Again, it's just one of those things where in, in life, I think you are very successful at everything you do because A, you're smart, and B, you've done the work, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think, I think you, you know, there was a saying when we were young, and we both believed in it. You know, you want to, and I, I, you've probably heard it too, when you go to your grave, you want, you want it to be pretty much ashes. You know, you want to be burned up. You want to use it all. You don't want to leave anything. And so that kind of keeps you going, even when you're, yeah. you know, wondering sometimes. Yeah. I never remember that it was too much work. No. I never remember that it was too much. I, I mean, I think there's something to be said also for, you know, putting stuff back in, taking vacations on your own, um, 
treating yourself really well. The best self-care is the best gift you can give yourself because that's a gift to everybody else too. And if you don't take good care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else. Right. And, and also... And your spouses need to do that too. Just... What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, no, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at them, but you know, are you got beautiful. You know, I I thought one of the questions was going to be, um, do you have, do you have any regrets? And the only regret I have in the whole world is that I never had a daughter because I really, really, really wanted a daughter. Now, but it would have been, of course, in addition to the three of you. Of course, of course. <laughs> our, our daughter, our daughter turned out to be Curtis James. But, what I want to say with that is I have three of the most fabulous daughter-in-laws in the whole world and four of the most fabulous, maybe five, who knows, um, granddaughters in the whole world. And so I'm so blessed in terms of being grateful. Something I never thought I'd have. At my mother's funeral, I did not have a living female relative on this earth. That's, that's not... Lexi. Lexi wasn't born yet. No, no. So I didn't have a blood female relative. And look at what the gifts I've gotten from you guys, what I've gotten back in terms of female friendships and companionship and fun. And, and, and some, well, to go back to the work and pro, uh, to set priorities is really critical. And for me, what are you, what are you talking about? I always like to explain. How much work? The, how much work I'm willing to work for the priorities that I've set. And like you guys, the fam my family was the highest priority. It didn't matter what. And as an example, I was just promoted to manager of marketing at American Motors, and it was my first day on the job, and I was and it was Halloween, and they called the meeting at five o'clock. No, at four o'clock, and I said that's Halloween. They be they're begging, and I they, we had major problems, and I said I'll come for a little while, and I left at four thirty and didn't know if I had a job to come back to. But you guys had to go to Halloween. It was more important to me than American Motors marketing. Because look at them. <laughs> so and I remember one day standing in the bathroom on the Westcott Crescent house. So, of course, you weren't born yet. So you guys were little. And, and the phone ringing. And it was a, some babysitter we had in the moment who couldn't show up. And I had to be at work. And you had to be at work. And we just stood there and looked at each other and said, now what do we do? We had no backup plan. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think you stayed home half a day and I stayed home half a day and I mean yeah so it, it sometimes what, what what looks like work isn't work if it's work if it's towards the, your your major priorities how's that um, so one of the last ones I have is um, talk a little bit about the adventure that you're on um, and why you're doing it and why you're doing it in your 70s, and what you hope to get out of it. Want me to go? Or do you want to go? Do you want to hear how it started? Mm -hmm. Of course. So we'll talk about the, what the, the Well, I'll tell the beginning of the story, the question, and you tell the question. Question. Okay. The question is the adventure that we're currently on, which, which, was, which I will tell you the adventure. And the adventure is um, two years ago at Christmas time, I was still working pretty much full time, not quite. And. <clears> um, not seeing retirement in my future because we hadn't we hadn't come up with a plan yet. We kept saying we're gonna, it'll come up. We'll figure it out sometime, you know. And uh, we got a Christmas card from our friend uh, friends Marilyn and Ron Steiner, and they said in the Christmas card, not just to us but to everybody on those letters, um, you know, that they were gonna they were, they'd bought a boat and they were gonna do the loop, which is circumnavigating the eastern third of the United States. And both of us looked at that card and, they, and we said to each other, not without us, they're not. And so we, call, well, what, I said, well, you know, we can't call them because what if they don't really want us to go with them? So we said, I, I wrote her a handwritten letter. Yeah. Well, they were gone somewhere for the holidays, didn't get back. I think we got a response like in February. But by that time, we had started looking into it and deciding that it was really what we wanted to do. Mm -hmm. We had the boat, we had the time and I just had to decide to retire and then you can tell then me. it became easy so uh, the whys are it's kind of like why not it, it's something we've never done and uh, we've always wanted to do yeah. some long distance traveling in the boat and it's it's really a unique thing that I don't think there's many places in the world where you actually can get 5,000 miles in in a relatively safe environment uh, 
you know, mostly in fresh water, or a lot of fresh water, and, uh, and and not be that far away from home. And that's what we can we can. Uh, we were sailing out of Chicago, and we had been gone two months, and I think we were only two hundred miles away from home. That's not <laughs> that's not that bad. And it, it's we were dragging it, our feet it's a little also, bit off about the river system, though. Yeah, yeah, it's also. Um, Kind of, kind of like a, uh, a model for you guys, you know, to do to do whatever you want. And it doesn't have to be, take a boat around anywhere, but make sure that you go after some dreams that you don't even know you have those dreams yet about, and just be open to what's going to come along. But I love being on the on the uh, the loop. The people we meet, they're, they've already been filtered. Some of them twice. First of all, they're boaters. So that f filters out a lot of other people. There's nobody that likes to drive, whatever. And the second filter is their loopers. And loopers tend to be a really goofy. They're a well-educated. They're not a wealthy, even though some of their boats cost a million, million two, like that. Um, but they're, they're, it's not glamorous because they're going through the same locks we are and with the same slimy ropes that are coming down and hold, we're holding on to. But and we all get together at, get, uh, get the docks at night and, and we all tell talk stories. About the same, same. We all brag about our grandkids, you know, our it, kids, our, and our kids, kids and our grandkids. And and you know what? I'm going to say this to you guys, and I don't know if it should be on tape or not. Uh, but there are there are times that we have to just shut up yeah. because there are lots of people who don't have nearly what we have in terms of kids and grandkids and the successes and the. The fun stories and the you know, but they're out there doing just what we're doing, and we have a really good time with them. But we we're very aware of of not um, over overstating the the fortunes that we have. Hmm. Can you right? can you uh, talk about your fiftieth? And I loved your explanation on not only if you remember it, but your explanation on why you didn't want to have a big party. It's like mm -hmm. you. Done that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot of parties. Well, you guys gave us the turn the page party when I went to part when I gave up my big job. In your state. Oh, uh, um, what's the question? Your explanation on why you didn't. Oh, why we didn't want a big fiftieth party. Yeah. Um, well, because you guys gave us a wonderful. Um, uh, turn the page party when I had gone, given up my big job because I was taking summers off at that point We were sailing we were do doing long-distance sailing. We were doing a lot of fun stuff already by that point point. and then um, So uh, That was a lovely party and we invited everybody we knew and it was up at your house in Lansing And it was it was fabulous and then when we did the loop We invited all those same people back and we had a big old party a going away party and you guys all helped with that So it was like at our 50th and and to me anniversaries are really something more private than parties We've all our night our anniversary is the night before New Year's Eve So, you know, we can go out and do anything we want to do because there's nobody out there and we generally go out by ourselves. That's been our tradition. Uh, if we don't go skiing somewhere with you guys or with somebody, um, we, you know, that's been our, um, our our mode is to just kind of either stay home or just ski when they're young. Yeah. The yeah. Kids are younger. Um, so to have a big anniversary, 50th anniversary party, didn't feel right, quite right. Well, you, you said something to the effect of how many times can we celebrate the same sort of thing? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah. 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 Which yeah. I think is cool, right? People yeah. get tired. Yeah. Yeah. And all of our friends said thank you very much. <laughs> yeah, right. Well, you had, you had also said, well, why are we doing what we're doing at 70? And basically because we didn't do them when we were 60. And, you know, so you got to do them now. Of, we are on the older end, for sure. Yeah. Most so people are doing this kind of thing in their you're 60s. On the fitter end as well. That the helps. What the fitter. Yeah. More physically yeah. fit. Yeah, you, can, you you know, and that's something is to stay physically fit in terms of advice because if you don't, you can't do this stuff. Yeah, well, I think that was my actual last question. If you had to say, uh, yeah, whatever, two, three traits um, that you think help for making a happy life. It's kind of a softball question, but, yeah. you know, re repeat it and then... I'll give one, you give one? Two or three traits... Um, that we think or characteristics maybe um, that make create a happy life one as I think is to be for me 
be more concerned about the people that I'm interfacing with their feelings to, to be when you when you're in a group to make to be concerned about how you feel about what's going on and what's being said um, that that helps me um, well I think you know taking good physical care of yourself so that you can you can make decisions to do things. I mean, you know, my bike rides in Europe were training rides. <laughs> I mean, those I wasn't physically fit to go do those, but I could manage it. I could still do it. She called me more names than you could believe. <laughs> um, I was thinking of something else, too. Don't, uh, you know, my mission, we, we did, a, we did a, um, an evening one time with Evie and Lee. They used to do these sort of growth kind of activities at their house, and we did an ev evening there one night. And the, the goal of the evening was to write your mission in life. And we were probably in our 40s, maybe 40, 50s, yeah. 50s, somewhere in there. It was 25 years ago, easily. And um, what we came up with was, or what I, I found mine today. I know exactly where it is, and I've known where it is, and I know what the mission is. And to have a mission in life has been, um, gives a lot of direction. And mine is, do you remember what yours was? Yeah. You want to go first? Oh, is this a test? <laughs> no. Well, I was just talking. Well, I, he, my mission was, uh, phys being physically fit was important to me. And so that was it. And then there was a, a, a part that came into it, is take something old and make it new. And uh, that, that's always been the, the, a, a prideful thing for me. And then uh, I think the last one was the empathy thing. I, I, I probably said something like learn to play the guitar or speak Spanish or some damn thing. Well, I think you know, that, that you're right about the empathy thing. And there's, there was a quote out recently that that's the most important national characteristic that we can have. And it's very much lacking out there um, today, in today's world. And um, it is, you know, being able to put yourself into somebody else's position and understand their feelings, even if you don't agree with them. Yeah. My mission was to better understand the world so it can be a better place for me and for the people I care about. And I, that sort of was where my life has been. Yeah, always. and you know the funny thing is when you're looking at maturity and wisdom and all that, the really hard thing, and I think I'm almost over it now, is to realize that I don't have to hit any more home runs. I don't have, if you guys tend to be my world, and that's not, I don't mean to put a lot of burden on you, but... No, no pressure. No pressure. But uh, how I react to you and, and to the few close friends I have, and, all, and I don't have to build another company, and I don't have to, uh, and that's really a, a, a neat feeling, that, uh, that I can take your grate off of your sailboat and put six coats of varnish on it, because I can. You know, that, that's, that's really okay. it. Okay, but given that, to, to go on that question, like how, so you're saying that now, um, what if you had learned that earlier? Yeah, who knows? You know, uh, in my 40s, I still, there was a, fee well, there's a, there was a feeling that, I, that there was still a home run in there, that, that uh, I could go. I always rationalized and I always thought, mm, I, I, was, I, I, I don't have a profession that does good like mom's social work value, but I can bring social work values into the engineering manufacturing community. <laughs> Which is really, it's really helped. And so that, that's been, I mean, maybe that was a triple to, to do from a baseball point of view. So those are, those are pretty comforting.